Volume three, chapter nine of the Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume three, chapter nine friendly counsels i felt strongly tempted at times to enlighten my mother and sister on the real character and circumstances of the persecuted tenant of wildfell hall and at first i greatly regretted having omitted to ask that lady's permission to do so but on due reflection i considered that if it were known to them it could not long remain a secret to the millwards and wilsons and such was my present appreciation of eliza millward's disposition that if once she got a clue to the story i should fear she would soon find means to enlighten mr huntingdon upon the place of his wife's retreat i would therefore wait patiently till these weary six months were over and then when the fugitive had found another home and i was permitted to write to her i would beg to be allowed to clear her name from these vile calumnies at present i must content myself with simply asserting that I knew them to be false, and would prove it some day to the shame of those who slandered her. I don't think anybody believed me, but everybody soon learned to avoid insinuating a word against her, or even mentioning her name in my presence. They thought I was so madly infatuated by the seductions of that unhappy lady that I was determined to support her in the very face of reason. And meantime, I grew insupportably morose and misanthropical from the idea that every one I met was harboring unworthy thoughts of the supposed Mrs. Graham, and would express them if he dared. My poor mother was quite distressed about me, but I couldn't help it, at least I thought I could not, though sometimes I felt a pang of remorse for my undutiful conduct to her, and made an effort to amend, attended with some partial success. And indeed, i was generally more humanized in my demeanor to her than to any one else mr lawrence excepted rose and fergus usually shunned my presence and it was well they did for i was not fit company for them nor they for me under the present circumstances mrs huntingdon did not leave wildfell hall till above two months after our farewell interview during that time she never appeared at church and i never went near the house i only knew she was still there by her brother's brief answers to my many and varied enquiries respecting her i was a very constant and attentive visitor to him throughout the whole period of his illness and convalescence not only from the interest i took in his recovery and my desire to cheer him up and make the utmost possible amends for my former brutality but from my growing attachment to himself and the increasing pleasure i found in his society partly from his increased cordiality to me but chiefly on account of his close connection both in blood and in affection with my adored helen i loved him for it better than i'd like to express and i took a secret delight in pressing those slender white fingers so marvellously like her own considering he was not a woman and in watching the passing changes in his fair pale features and observing the intonations of his voice detecting resemblances which i wondered had never struck me before he provoked me at times indeed by his evident reluctance to talk to me about his sister though i did not question the friendliness of his motives in wishing to discourage my remembrance of her his recovery was not quite so rapid as he had expected it to be he was not able to mount his pony till a fortnight after the date of our reconciliation and the first use he made of his returning strength was to ride over by night to wildfell hall to see his sister it was a hazardous enterprise both for him and for her but he thought it necessary to consult with her on the subject of her projected departure if not to calm her apprehensions respecting his health and the worst result was a slight relapse of his illness for no one knew of the visit but the inmates of the old hall except myself and i believe it had not been his intention to mention it to me for when i came to see him the next day and observed he was not so well as he ought to have been he merely said he had caught cold by being out too late in the evening you'll never be able to see your sister if you don't take care of yourself said i a little provoked at the circumstance on her account instead of commiserating with him i've seen her already said he quietly you've seen her cried i in astonishment yes and then he told me what considerations had impelled him 
to make the venture and with what precautions he had made it and how was she i eagerly asked as usual was the brief though sad reply as usual that is far from happy and far from strong she is not positively ill returned he and she will recover her spirits in a while i have no doubt but so many trials have been almost too much for her how threatening those clouds look continued he turning towards the window we shall have thunder showers before night i imagine and they are just in the midst of stacking my corn have you got yours all in yet no and lawrence did she did your sister mention me she asked if i had seen you lately and what else did she say i cannot tell you all she said replied he with a slight smile for we talked a good deal though my stay was but short but our conversation was chiefly on the subject of her intended departure which i begged her to delay till i was better able to assist her in her search after another home but did she say no more about me she did not say much about you markham i should not have encouraged her to do so had she been inclined but happily she was not she only asked a few questions concerning you and seemed satisfied with my brief answers wherein she showed herself wiser than her friend and i may tell you too that she seemed to be far more anxious lest you should think too much of her than lest you should forget her she was right but i fear your anxiety is quite the other way respecting her no it is not i wish her to be happy but i don't wish her to forget me altogether she knows it is impossible that i should forget her and she is right to wish me not to remember her too well i should not desire her to regret me too deeply but i can scarcely imagine she will make herself very unhappy about me because i know i am not worthy of it except in my appreciation of her you are neither of you worthy of a broken heart nor of all the sighs and tears and sorrowful thoughts that have been and i fear will be wasted upon you both but at present each has a more exalted opinion of the other than i fear he or she deserves and my sister's feelings are naturally full as keen as yours and i believe more constant but she has the good sense and fortitude to strive against them in this particular and i trust she will not rest till she has entirely weaned her thoughts he hesitated from me said i and i wish you would make the like exertions continued he did she tell you that that was her intention no the question was not broached between us there was no necessity for it for i had no doubt that such was her determination to forget me yes markham why not oh well was my only audible reply but i internally answered no lawrence you're wrong there she is not determined to forget me it would be wrong to forget one so deeply and fondly devoted to her who can so thoroughly appreciate her excellencies and sympathize with all her thoughts as i can do and it would be wrong in me to forget so excellent and divine a piece of god's creation as she when i have once so truly loved and known her but i said no more to him on that subject i instantly started a new topic of conversation and soon took leave of my companion with a feeling of less cordiality towards him than usual perhaps i had no right to be annoyed at him but i was so nevertheless in little more than a week after this i met him returning from a visit to the wilsons and i now resolved to do him a good turn though at the expense of his feelings and perhaps at the risk of incurring that displeasure which is so commonly the reward of those who give disagreeable information or tender their advice unasked in this believe me i was actuated by no motives of revenge for the occasional annoyances i had lately sustained from him nor yet by any feeling of malevolent enmity towards miss wilson but purely by the fact that i could not endure that such a woman should be mrs huntingdon's sister and that as well for his own sake as for hers i could not bear to think of his being deceived into a union with one so unworthy of him and so utterly unfitted to be the partner of his quiet home and the companion of his life he had had uncomfortable suspicions on that head himself i imagined but such was his inexperience and such were the lady's powers of attraction and her skill in bringing them to bear upon his young imagination that they had not disturbed him long and i believe the only effectual causes of the vacillating indecision that had preserved him hitherto from making an actual declaration of love 
was the consideration of her connections and especially of her mother whom he could not abide had they lived at a distance he might have surmounted the objection but within two or three miles of woodford it was really no light matter you've been to call on the wilsons lawrence said i as i walked beside his pony yes replied he slightly averting his face i thought it but civil to take the first opportunity of returning their kind attentions since they have been so very particular and constant in their enquiries throughout the whole course of my illness it's all miss wilson's doing and if it is returned he with a very perceptible blush is that any reason why i should not make a suitable acknowledgment it is a reason why you should not make the acknowledgment she looks for let us drop that subject if you please said he in evident displeasure no lawrence with your leave we'll continue it a while longer and i'll tell you something now we're about it which you may believe or not as you choose only please to remember that it is not my custom to speak falsely and that in this case i can have no motive for misrepresenting the truth well markham what now miss wilson hates your sister it may be natural enough that in her ignorance of the relationship she should feel some degree of enmity against her but no good or amiable woman would be capable of evincing that bitter cold-blooded designing malice towards a fancied rival that i have observed in her markham yes and it is my belief that eliza millward and she if not the very originators of the slanderous reports that have been propagated were designedly the encouragers and chief disseminators of them she was not desirous to mix up your name in the matter of course but her delight was and still is to blacken your sister's character to the utmost of her power without risking too greatly the exposure of her own malevolence i cannot believe it interrupted my companion his face burning with indignation well as i cannot prove it i must content myself with asserting that it is so to the best of my belief but as you would not willingly marry miss wilson if it were so you will do well to be cautious till you have proved it to be otherwise i never told you markham that i intended to marry miss wilson said he proudly no but whether you do or not she intends to marry you did she tell you so no but then you have no right to make such an assertion respecting her he slightly quickened his pony's pace but i laid my hand on its mane determined he should not leave me yet wait a moment lawrence and let me explain myself and don't be so very i don't know what to call it inaccessible as you are i know what you think of jane wilson and i believe i know how far you are mistaken in your opinion you think she is singularly charming elegant sensible and refined you are not aware that she is selfish cold-hearted ambitious artful shallow-minded enough markham enough no let me finish you don't know that if you married her your home would be rayless and comfortless and it would break your heart at last to find yourself united to one so wholly incapable of sharing your tastes feelings and ideas so utterly destitute of sensibility good feeling and true nobility of soul have you done asked my companion quietly yes i know you hate me for my impertinence but i don't care if it only conduces to preserve you from that fatal mistake well returned he with a rather wintry smile i'm glad you have overcome or forgotten your own afflictions so far as to be able to study so deeply the affairs of others and trouble your head so unnecessarily about the fancied or possible calamities of their future life we parted somewhat coldly again but still we did not cease to be friends and my well-meant warning though it might have been more judiciously delivered as well as more thankfully received was not wholly unproductive of the desired effect his visit to the wilsons was not repeated and though in our subsequent interviews he never mentioned her name to me nor i to him i have reason to believe he pondered my words in his mind eagerly though covertly sought information respecting the fair lady from other quarters secretly compared my character of her with what he had himself observed and what he heard from others and finally came to the conclusion that all things considered she had much better remain miss wilson of rycote farm than be transmuted into mrs lawrence of woodford hall i believe too that he soon learned to contemplate with secret amazement his former predilection 
and to congratulate himself on the lucky escape he had made but he never confessed it to me or hinted one word of acknowledgment for the part i had had in his deliverance but this was not surprising to any one that knew him as i did as for jane wilson she of course was disappointed and embittered by the sudden cold neglect and ultimate desertion of her former admirer had i done wrong to blight her cherished hopes i think not and certainly my conscience has never accused me from that day to this of any evil design in the matter end of volume three chapter nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume three chapter ten of the tenant of wildfell hall by anne bronte this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume three chapter ten startling intelligence one morning about the beginning of november while i was inditing some business letters shortly after breakfast eliza millward came to call upon my sister rose had neither the discrimination nor the virulence to regard the little demon as i did and they still preserved their former intimacy at the moment of her arrival however there was no one in the room but fergus and myself my mother and sister being both of them absent on household cares intent but i was not going to lay myself out for her amusement whoever else might so incline i merely honoured her with a careless salutation and a few words of course and then went on with my writing leaving my brother to be more polite if he chose but she wanted to tease me what a pleasure it is to find you at home mr markham said she with a disingenuously malicious smile i so seldom see you now for you never come to the vicarage papa is quite offended i can tell you she added playfully looking into my face with an impertinent laugh as she seated herself half beside and half before my desk off the corner of the table i have had a good deal to do of late said i without looking up from my letter have you indeed somebody said you had been strangely neglecting your business these last few months somebody said wrong for these last two months especially i have been particularly plodding and diligent ah well there's nothing like active employment i suppose to console the afflicted and excuse me mr markham but you look so very far from well and have been by all accounts so moody and thoughtful of late i could almost think you have some secret care preying on your spirits formerly said she timidly i could have ventured to ask you what it was and what i could do to comfort you i dare not do it now you're very kind miss eliza when i think you can do anything to comfort me i'll make bold to tell you pray do i suppose i mayn't guess what it is that troubles you there's no necessity for i'll tell you plainly the thing that troubles me the most at present is a young lady sitting at my elbow and preventing me from finishing my letter and thereafter repairing to my daily business before she could reply to this ungallant speech rose entered the room and miss eliza rising to greet her they both seated themselves near the fire where that idle lad fergus was standing leaning his shoulder against the corner of the chimney-piece with his legs crossed and his hands in his breeches pockets now rose i'll tell you a bit of news i hope you've not heard it before for good bad or indifferent one always likes to be the first to tell it's about that sad mrs graham hush whispered fergus in a tone of solemn import we never mention her her name is never heard and glancing up i caught him with its eye askance on me and his finger pointed to his forehead then winking at the young lady with a doleful shake of the head he whispered a monomania but don't mention it all right but that i should be sorry to injure any one's feelings returned she speaking below her breath another time perhaps speak out miss eliza said i not deigning to notice the other's buffooneries you needn't fear to say anything in my presence that is true well answered she perhaps you know already that mrs graham's husband is not really dead and that she had run away from him i started and felt my face glow but i bent it over my letter and went on folding it up as she proceeded but perhaps you did not know that she has now gone back to him again 
and that a perfect reconciliation has taken place between them only think she continued turning to the confounded rose what a fool the man must be and who gave you this piece of intelligence miss eliza said i interrupting my sister's exclamations i had it from a very authentic source sir from whom may i ask from one of the servants at woodford oh i was not aware that you are on such intimate terms with mr lawrence's household it was not from the man himself that i heard it but he told it in confidence to our maid sarah and sarah told it to me in confidence i suppose and you tell it in confidence to us but i can tell you that it is but a lame story after all and scarcely one half of it true while i spoke i completed the sealing and direction of my letters with a somewhat unsteady hand in spite of all my efforts to retain composure and in spite of my firm conviction that the story was a lame one that the supposed mrs graham most certainly had not voluntarily gone back to her husband or dreamt of a reconciliation most likely she was gone away and the tale-bearing servant not knowing what was become of her had conjectured that such was the case and our fair visitor had detailed it as a certainty delighted with such an opportunity of tormenting me but it was possible barely possible that someone might have betrayed her and she had been taken away by force determined to know the worst i hastily pocketed my two letters and muttering something about being too late for the post left the room rushed into the yard and vociferously called for my horse no one being there i dragged him out of the stable myself strapped the saddle on to his back and the bridle on to his head mounted and speedily galloped away to woodford i found its owner pensively strolling in the grounds is your sister gone were my first words as i grasped his hand instead of the usual inquiry after his health yes she's gone was his answer so calmly spoken that my terror was at once removed i suppose i mayn't know where she is said i as i dismounted and relinquished my horse to the gardener who being the only servant within call had been summoned by his master from his employment of raking up the dead leaves on the lawn to take him to the stables my companion gravely took my arm and leading me away to the garden thus answered my question she is at grassdale manor in blankshire where cried i with a convulsive start at grassdale manor how was it i gasped who betrayed her she went of her own accord impossible lawrence she could not be so frantic exclaimed i vehemently grasping his arm as if to force him to unsay those hateful words she did persisted he in the same grave collected manner as before and not without reason he continued gently disengaging himself from my grasp mr huntingdon is ill and so she went to nurse him yes fool i could not help exclaiming and lawrence looked up with a rather reproachful glance is he dying then i think not markham and how many more nurses has he how many ladies are there besides to take care of him none he was alone or she would not have gone oh confound it this is intolerable what is that he should be alone i attempted no reply for i was not sure that this circumstance did not partly conduce to my distraction i therefore continued to pace the walk in silent anguish with my hand pressed to my forehead then suddenly pausing and turning to my companion i impatiently exclaimed why did she take this infatuated step what fiend persuaded her to it nothing persuaded her but her own sense of duty humbug i was half inclined to say so myself markham at first i assure you it was not by my advice that she went for i detest that man as fervently as you can do except indeed that his reformation would give me much greater pleasure than his death but all i did was to inform her of the circumstance of his illness the consequence of a fall from his horse in hunting and to tell her that that unhappy person miss myers had left him some time ago it was ill done now when he finds the convenience of her presence he will make all manner of lying speeches and false fair promises for the future and she will believe him and then her condition will be ten times worse and ten times more irremediable than before 
there does not appear to be much ground for such apprehensions at present said he producing a letter from his pocket from the account i received this morning i should say it was her writing by an irresistible impulse i held out my hand and the words let me see it involuntarily passed my lips he was evidently reluctant to grant the request but while he hesitated i snatched it from his hand recollecting myself however the minute after i offered to restore it here take it said i if you don't want me to read it no replied he you may read it if you like i read it and so may you grassdale november fourth dear frederick i know you will be anxious to hear from me and i will tell you all i can mr huntingdon is very ill but not dying or in any immediate danger and he is rather better at present than he was when i came i found the house in sad confusion mrs greaves benson every decent servant had left and those that were come to supply their places were a negligent disorderly set to say no worse i must change them again if i stay a professional nurse a grim hard old woman had been hired to attend the wretched invalid he suffers much and has no fortitude to bear him through the immediate injuries he sustained from the accident however were not very severe and would as the doctor says have been but trifling to a man of temperate habits but with him it is very different on the night of my arrival when i first entered his room he was lying in a kind of half delirium he did not notice me till i spoke and then he mistook me for another is it you alice come again he murmured what did you leave me for it is i arthur it is helen your wife i replied my wife said he with a start for heaven's sake don't mention her i have none devil take her he cried a moment after and you too what did you do it for i said no more but observing that he kept gazing towards the foot of the bed i went and sat there placing the light so as to shine full upon me for i thought he might be dying and i wanted him to know me for a long time he lay silently looking upon me first with a vacant stare then with a fixed gaze of strange growing intensity at last he startled me by suddenly raising himself on his elbow and demanding in a horrified whisper with his eyes still fixed upon me who is it it is helen huntingdon said i quietly rising at the same time and removing to a less conspicuous position i must be going mad cried he or something delirious perhaps but leave me whoever you are i can't bear that white face and those eyes for god's sake go and send me somebody else that doesn't look like that i went at once and sent the hired nurse but next morning i ventured to enter his chamber again and taking the nurse's place by his bedside i watched him and waited on him for several hours showing myself as little as possible and only speaking when necessary and then not above my breath at first he addressed me as the nurse but on my crossing the room to draw up the window blinds in obedience to his directions he said no it isn't nurse it's alice stay with me do that old hag will be the death of me i mean to stay with you said i and after that he would call me alice or some other name almost equally repugnant to my feelings i forced myself to endure it for a while fearing a contradiction might disturb him too much but when having asked for a glass of water while i held it to his lips he murmured thanks dearest i could not help distinctly observing you would not say so if you knew me intending to follow that up with another declaration of my identity but he merely muttered an incoherent reply so i dropped it again till some time after when as i was bathing his forehead and temples with vinegar and water to relieve the heat and pain in his head he observed after looking earnestly upon me for some minutes i have such strange fancies i can't get rid of them and they won't let me rest and the most singular and pertinacious of them all is your face and voice they seem just like hers i could swear at this moment that she was by my side she is said i that seems comfortable continued he without noticing my words and while you do it the other fancies fade away but this only strengthens go on go on till it vanishes too i can't stand such a mania as this it would kill me 
it never will vanish said i distinctly for it is the truth the truth he cried starting up as if an asp had stung him you don't mean to say that you are really she i do but you needn't shrink away from me as if i were your greatest enemy i am come to take care of you and do what none of them would do oh for god's sake don't torment me now cried he in pitiable agitation and then he began to mutter bitter curses against me or the evil fortune that had brought me there while i put down the sponge and basin and resumed my seat at the bedside where are they said he have they all left me servants and all there are servants within call if you want them but you had better lie down now and be quiet none of them could or would attend you as carefully as i shall do i can't understand it at all said he in bewildered perplexity was it a dream that and he covered his eyes with his hand as if trying to unravel the mystery no arthur it was not a dream that your conduct was such as to oblige me to leave you but i heard that you were ill and alone and i am come back to nurse you you need not fear to trust me tell me all your wants and i will try to satisfy them there is no one else to care for you and i shall not upbraid you now oh i see said he with a bitter smile it's an act of christian charity whereby you hope to gain a higher seat in heaven for yourself and scoop a deeper pit in hell for me no i came to offer you that comfort and assistance your situation required and if i could benefit your soul as well as your body and awaken some sense of contrition and oh yes if you could overwhelm me with remorse and confusion of face now's the time what have you done with my son he is well and you may see him some time if you will compose yourself but not now where is he he is safe is he here wherever he is you will not see him till you have promised to leave him entirely under my care and protection and to let me take him away whenever and wherever i please if i should hereafter judge it necessary to remove him again but we will talk of that to-morrow you must be quiet now no let me see him now i promise if it must be so no i swear it as god is in heaven now then let me see him but i cannot trust your oaths and promises i must have a written agreement and you must sign it in presence of a witness but not to-day to-morrow no to-day now persisted he and he was in such a state of feverish excitement and so bent upon the immediate gratification of his wish that i thought it better to grant it at once as i saw he would not rest till i did but i was determined my son's interest should not be forgotten and having clearly written out the promise i wished mr huntingdon to give upon a slip of paper i deliberately read it over to him and made him sign it in the presence of rachel he begged i would not insist upon this it was a useless exposure of my want of faith in his word to the servant i told him i was sorry but since he had forfeited my confidence he must take the consequence he next pleaded inability to hold the pen then we must wait until you can hold it said i upon which he said he would try but then he could not see to write i placed my finger where the signature was to be and told him he might write his name in the dark if he only knew where to put it but he had not power to form the letters in that case you must be too ill to see the child said i and finding me inexorable he at length managed to ratify the agreement and i bade rachel send the boy all this may strike you as harsh but i felt i must not lose my present advantage and my son's future welfare should not be sacrificed to any mistaken tenderness for this man's feelings little arthur had not forgotten his father but thirteen months of absence during which he had seldom been permitted to hear a word about him or hardly to whisper his name had rendered him somewhat shy and when he was ushered into the darkened room where the sick man lay so altered from his former self with fiercely flushed face and wildly gleaming eyes he instinctively clung to me and stood looking on his father with a countenance expressive of far more awe than pleasure come here arthur said the latter extending his hand towards him the child went and timidly touched that burning hand but almost started in alarm when his father suddenly clutched his arm and drew him nearer to his side 
you know me asked mr huntingdon intently perusing his features yes who am i papa are you glad to see me yes you're not replied the disappointed parent relaxing his hold and darting a vindictive glance at me arthur thus released crept back to me and put his hand in mine his father swore i had made the child hate him and abused and cursed me bitterly the instant he began i sent our son out of the room and when he paused to breathe i calmly assured him that he was entirely mistaken i had never once attempted to prejudice his child against him i did indeed desire him to forget you i said and especially to forget the lessons you taught him and for that cause and to lessen the danger of discovery i own i have generally discouraged his inclination to talk about you but no one can blame me for that i think the invalid only replied by groaning aloud and rolling his head on a pillow in a paroxysm of impatience i am in hell already cried he this cursed thirst is burning my heart to ashes will nobody before he could finish the sentence i had poured out a glass of some acidulated cooling drink that was on the table and brought it to him he drank it greedily but muttered as i took away the glass i suppose you're heaping coals of fire on my head you think not noticing this speech i asked if there was anything else i could do for him yes i'll give you another opportunity of showing your christian magnanimity sneered he set my pillow straight and these confounded bedclothes i did so there now get me another glass of that slop i complied this is delightful isn't it said he with a malicious grin as i held it to his lips you never hoped for such a glorious opportunity now shall i stay with you said i as i replaced the glass on the table or will you be more quiet if i go and send the nurse oh yes you're wondrous gentle and obliging but you've driven me mad with it all responded he with an impatient toss i'll leave you then said i and i withdrew and did not trouble him with my presence again that day except for a minute or two at a time just to see how he was and what he wanted next morning the doctor ordered him to be bled and after that he was more subdued and tranquil i passed half the day in his room at different intervals my presence did not appear to agitate or irritate him as before and he accepted my services quietly without any bitter remarks indeed he scarcely spoke at all except to make known his wants and hardly then but on the morrow that is to-day in proportion as he recovered from the state of exhaustion and stupefaction his ill nature appeared to revive oh this sweet revenge cried he when i had been doing all i could to make him comfortable and to remedy the carelessness of his nurse and you can enjoy it with such a quiet conscience too because it's all in the way of duty it is well for me that i am doing my duty said i with a bitterness i could not repress for it is the only comfort i have and the satisfaction of my own conscience it seems is the only reward i need look for he looked rather surprised at the earnestness of my manner what reward did you look for he asked you will think me a liar if i tell you but i did hope to benefit you as well to better your mind as to alleviate your present sufferings but it appears i am to do neither your own bad spirit will not let me as far as you are concerned i have sacrificed my own feelings and all the little earthly comfort that was left me to no purpose and every little thing i do for you is ascribed to self-righteous malice and refined revenge it's all very fine i dare say said he eyeing me with stupid amazement and of course i ought to be melted to tears of penitence and admiration at the sight of so much generosity and superhuman goodness but you see i can't manage it however pray do me all the good you can if you do really find any pleasure in it for you perceive i am almost as miserable just now as you need wish to see me since you came i confess i have had better attendance than before for these wretches neglected me shamefully and all my old friends seem to have fairly forsaken me i've had a dreadful time of it i assure you i sometimes thought i should have died do you think there's any chance there's always a chance of death and it is always well to live with such a chance in view yes yes but do you think there's any likelihood that this illness will have a fatal termination 
i cannot tell but supposing it should how are you prepared to meet the event why the doctor told me i wasn't to think about it for i was sure to get better if i stuck to his regimen and prescriptions i hope you may arthur but neither the doctor nor i can speak with certainty in such a case there is internal injury and it is difficult to know to what extent there now you want to scare me to death no but i don't want to lull you to false security if a consciousness of the uncertainty of life can dispose you to serious and useful thoughts i would not deprive you of the benefit of such reflections whether you do eventually recover or not does the idea of death appall you very much it's just the only thing i can't bear to think of so if you've any but it must come some time interrupted i and if it be years hence it will as certainly overtake you as if it came to-day and no doubt be as unwelcome then as now unless you oh hang it don't torment me with your preachments now unless you want to kill me outright i can't stand it i tell you i've sufferings enough without that if you think there's danger save me from it and then in gratitude i'll hear whatever you like to say i accordingly dropped the unwelcome topic and now frederick i think i may bring my letter to a close from these details you may form your own judgment of the state of my patient and of my own position and future prospects let me hear from you soon and i will write again to tell you how we get on but now that my presence is tolerated and even required in the sick-room i shall have but little time to spare between my husband and my son for i must not entirely neglect the latter it would not do to keep him always with rachel and i dare not leave him for a moment with any of the other servants or suffer him to be alone lest he should meet them if his father get worse i shall ask esther hargrave to take charge of him for a time till i have reorganized the household at least but i greatly prefer keeping him under my own eye i find myself in rather a singular position i am exerting my utmost endeavours to promote the recovery and reformation of my husband and if i succeed what shall i do my duty of course but how no matter i can perform the task that is before me now and god will give me strength to do whatever he requires hereafter good-bye dear frederick helen huntingdon what do you think of it said lawrence as i silently refolded the letter it seems to me returned i that she is casting her pearls before swine may they be satisfied with trampling them under their feet and not turn again and rend her but i shall say no more against her i see that she was actuated by the best and noblest motives in what she has done and if the act is not a wise one may heaven protect her from its consequences may i keep this letter lawrence you see she has never once mentioned me throughout or made the most distant allusion to me therefore there can be no impropriety or harm in it and therefore why should you wish to keep it were not these characters written by her hand and were not these words conceived in her mind and many of them spoken by her lips well said he and so i kept it otherwise halford you could never have become so thoroughly acquainted with its contents and when you write said i will you have the goodness to ask her if i may be permitted to enlighten my mother and sister on her real history and circumstance just so far as is necessary to make the neighbourhood sensible of the shameful injustice they have done her i want no tender messages but just ask her that and tell her it is the greatest favour she could do me and tell her no nothing more you see i know the address and i might write to her myself but i am so virtuous as to refrain well i'll do this for you markham and as soon as you receive an answer you'll let me know if all be well i'll come myself and tell you immediately end of volume three chapter ten recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume three chapter eleven of the tenant of wildfell hall by anne bronte this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume three chapter eleven further intelligence five or six days after this mr lawrence paid us the honour of a call and when he and i were alone together 
which I contrived as soon as possible by bringing him out to look at my corn stacks, he showed me another letter from his sister. This one he was quite willing to submit to my longing gaze. He thought, I suppose, it would do me good. The only answer it gave to my message was this. Mr. Markham is at liberty to make such revelations concerning me as he judges necessary. He will know that I should wish but little to be said on the subject. I hope he is well, but tell him he must not think of me. I can give you a few extracts from the rest of the letter, for I was permitted to keep this also, perhaps as an antidote to all pernicious hopes and fancies. He is decidedly better, but very low from the depressing effects of his severe illness and the strict regimen he is obliged to observe, so opposite to all his previous habits. It is deplorable to see how completely his past life has degenerated his once noble constitution and vitiated the whole system of his organization. But the doctor says he may now be considered out of danger if he will only continue to observe the necessary restrictions. Some stimulating cordials he must have, but they should be judiciously diluted and sparingly used, and I find it very difficult to keep him to this. At first his extreme dread of death rendered the task an easy one, but in proportion as he feels his acute suffering abating and sees the danger receding, the more intractable he becomes. Now also his appetite for food is beginning to return, and here too his long habits of self-indulgence are greatly against him. I watch and restrain him as well as I can, and often get bitterly abused for my rigid severity. Sometimes he contrives to elude my vigilance, and sometimes acts in open opposition to my will. But he is now so completely reconciled to my attendance in general that he is never satisfied when I am not by his side. I am obliged to be a little stiff with him sometimes, or he would make a complete slave of me. And I know it would be unpardonable weakness to give up all other interests for him. I have the servants to overlook, and my little Arthur to attend to and my own health too, all of which would be entirely neglected were I to satisfy his exorbitant demands. I do not generally sit up at nights, for I think that the nurse who has made it her business is better qualified for such undertakings than I am. But still, an unbroken night's rest is what I but seldom enjoy, and never can venture to reckon upon. For my patient makes no scruple of calling me up at any hour when his wants or his fancies require my presence. But he is manifestly afraid of my displeasure, and if at one time he tries my patience by his unreasonable exactions and fretful complaints and reproaches, at another he depresses me by his abject submission and deprecatory self-abasement when he fears he has gone too far. But all this I can readily pardon. I know it is chiefly the result of his enfeebled frame and disordered nerves. What annoys me the most is his occasional attempts at affectionate fondness that I can neither credit nor return. Not that I hate him. His sufferings and my own laborious care have given him some claim to my regard, to my affection even, if he would only be quiet and sincere, and content to let things remain as they are. But the more he tries to conciliate me, the more I shrink from him and from the future. Helen, what do you mean to do when I get well? he asked this morning. Will you run away again? It entirely depends upon your own conduct. Oh, I'll be very good. But if I find it necessary to leave you, Arthur, I shall not run away. You know I have your own promise that I may go whenever I please and take my son with me. Oh, but you shall have no cause. And then followed a variety of professions, which I rather coldly checked. Will you not forgive me then, said he? Yes, I have forgiven you, but I know you cannot love me as you once did, and I should be very sorry if you were to, for I could not pretend to return it. So let us drop the subject and never recur to it again. By what I have done for you, you may judge of what I will do, if it be not incompatible with the higher duty I owe to my son, higher because he never forfeited his claims and because i hope to do more good to him than i can ever do to you and if you wish me to feel kindly towards you it is deeds not words that must purchase my affection and esteem his sole reply to this was a slight grimace 
and a scarcely perceptible shrug alas unhappy man words with him are so much cheaper than deeds it was as if i had said pounds not pence must buy the article you want and then he sighed a querulous self-commiserating sigh as if in pure regret that he the loved and courted of so many worshippers should be now abandoned to the mercy of a harsh exacting cold-hearted woman like that and even glad of what kindness she chose to bestow it's a pity isn't it said i and whether i rightly divined his musings or not the observation chimed in with his thoughts for he answered it can't be helped with a rueful smile at my penetration i have seen esther hargrave twice she is a charming creature but her blithe spirit is almost broken and her sweet temper almost spoiled by the still unremitting persecutions of her mother in behalf of her rejected suitor not violent but wearisome and unremitting like a continual dropping the unnatural parent seems determined to make her daughter's life a burden if she will not yield to her desires mamma does all she can said she to make me feel myself a burden and encumbrance to the family and the most ungrateful selfish and undutiful daughter that ever was born and walter too is as stern and cold and haughty as if he hated me outright i believe i should have yielded at once if i had known from the beginning how much resistance would have cost me but now for very obstinacy's sake i will stand out a bad motive for a good resolve i answered but however i know you have better motives really for your perseverance and i counsel you to keep them still in view trust me i will i threaten mamma sometimes that i'll run away and disgrace the family by earning my own livelihood if she torments me any more and then that frightens her a little but i will do it in good earnest if they don't mind be quiet and patient a while said i and better times will come poor girl i wish somebody that was worthy to possess her would come and take her away don't you frederick if the perusal of this letter filled me with dismay for helen's future life and mine there was one great source of consolation it was now in my power to clear her name from every foul aspersion the millwards and the wilsons should see with their own eyes the bright sun bursting from the cloud and they should be scorched and dazzled by its beams and my own friends too should see it they whose suspicions had been such gall and wormwood to my soul to effect this i had only to drop the seed into the ground and it would soon become a stately branching herb a few words to my mother and sister i knew would suffice to spread the news throughout the whole neighbourhood without any further exertion on my part rose was delighted and as soon as i had told her all i thought proper which was all i affected to know she flew with alacrity to put on her bonnet and shawl and hastened to carry the glad tidings to the millwards and wilsons glad tidings i suspect to none but herself and mary millward that steady sensible girl whose sterling worth had been so quickly perceived and duly valued by the supposed mrs graham in spite of her plain outside and who on her part had been better able to see and appreciate that lady's true character and qualities than the brightest genius among them as i may never have occasion to mention her again i may as well tell you here that she was at this time privately engaged to richard wilson a secret i believe to every one but their two selves that worthy student was now at cambridge where his most exemplary conduct and his diligent perseverance in the pursuit of learning carried him safely through and eventually brought him with hard-earned honours and an untarnished reputation to the close of his collegiate career in due time he became mr millward's first and only curate for that gentleman's declining years forced him at last to acknowledge that the duties of his extensive parish were a little too much for those vaunted energies which he was wont to boast over his younger and less active brethren of the cloth this was what the patient faithful lovers had privately planned and quietly waited for years ago and in due time they were united to the astonishment of the little world they lived in that had long since declared them both born to single blessedness affirming it impossible that the pale retiring bookworm should ever summon courage to seek a wife or be able to obtain one if he did 
and equally impossible that the plain-looking plain-dealing unattractive unconciliating miss millward should ever find a husband they still continued to live at the vicarage the lady dividing her time between her father her husband and their poor parishioners and subsequently her rising family and now that the reverend michael millward has been gathered to his fathers full of years and honors the reverend edward wilson has succeeded him to the vicarage of lindenhope greatly to the satisfaction of its inhabitants who had so long tried and fully proved his merits and those of his excellent and well-loved partner if you are interested in the after fate of that lady's sister i can only tell you what perhaps you have heard from another quarter that some twelve or thirteen years ago she relieved the happy couple of her presence by marrying a wealthy tradesman of l and i don't envy him his bargain i fear she leads him a rather uncomfortable life though happily he is too dull to perceive the extent of his misfortune i have little enough to do with her myself we have not met for many years but i am well assured she has not yet forgotten or forgiven either her former lover or the lady whose superior qualities first opened his eyes to the folly of his boyish attachment as for richard wilson's sister she having been wholly unable to recapture mr lawrence or obtain any partner rich and elegant enough to suit her ideas of what the husband of jane wilson ought to be is yet in single blessedness shortly after the death of her mother she withdrew the light of her presence from rycote farm finding it impossible any longer to endure the rough manners and unsophisticated habits of her honest brother robert and his worthy wife or the idea of being identified with such vulgar people in the eyes of the world and took lodgings in blank the county town where she lived and still lives i suppose in a kind of close-fisted cold uncomfortable gentility doing no good to others and but little to herself spending her days in fancy work and scandal referring frequently to her brother the vicar and her sister the vicar's lady but never to her brother the farmer and her sister the farmer's wife seeing as much company as she can without too much expense but loving no one and beloved by none a cold-hearted supercilious keenly insidiously censorious old maid End of Volume 3, Chapter 11, Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 3, Chapter 12, of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 3, Chapter 12 Quote the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it End quote. though mr lawrence's health was now quite re-established my visits to woodford were as unremitting as ever though often less protracted than before we seldom talked about mrs huntingdon but yet we never met without mentioning her for I never sought his company but with the hope of hearing something about her, and he never sought mine at all, because he saw me often enough without. But I always began to talk of other things, and waited first to see if he would introduce the subject. If he did not, I would casually ask, Have you heard from your sister lately? If he said no, the matter was dropped. If he said yes, I would venture to inquire, How is she? But never, How is her husband? though i might be burning to know because i had not the hypocrisy to profess any anxiety for his recovery and i had not the face to express any desire for a contrary result had i any such desire i fear i must plead guilty but since you have heard my confession you must hear my justification as well a few of the excuses at least wherewith i sought to pacify my own accusing conscience in the first place you see his life did harm to others and evidently no good to himself and though i wished it to terminate i would not have hastened its close if by the lifting of a finger i could have done so or if a spirit had whispered in my ear that a single effort of the will would be enough unless indeed i had the power to exchange him for some other victim of the grave whose life might be of service to his race and whose death would be lamented by his friends 
but was there any harm in wishing that among the many thousands whose souls would certainly be required of them before the year was over this wretched mortal might be one i thought not and therefore i wished with all my heart that it might please heaven to remove him to a better world or if that might not be still to take him out of this for if he were unfit to answer the summons now after a warning sickness and with such an angel by his side it seemed but too certain that he never would be that on the contrary returning health would bring returning lust and villainy and as he grew more certain of recovery more accustomed to her generous goodness his feelings would become more callous his heart more flinty and impervious to her persuasive arguments but god knew best meantime however i could not but be anxious for the result of his decrees knowing as i did that leaving myself entirely out of the question however helen might feel interested in her husband's welfare however she might deplore his fate still while he lived she must be miserable a fortnight passed away and my enquiries were always answered in the negative at length a welcome yes drew from me the second question lawrence divined my anxious thoughts and appreciated my reserve i feared at first he was going to torture me by unsatisfactory replies and either leave me quite in the dark concerning what i wanted to know or force me to drag the information out of him morsel by morsel by direct enquiries and serve you right you will say but he was more merciful and in a little while he put his sister's letter into my hand i silently read it and restored it to him without comment or remark this mode of procedure suited him so well that thereafter he always pursued the plan of showing me her letters at once when i inquired after her if there were any to show it was so much less trouble than to tell me their contents and i received such confidences so quietly and discreetly that he was never induced to discontinue them but i devoured those precious letters with my eyes and never let them go till their contents were stamped upon my mind and when i got home the most important passages were entered in my diary among the remarkable events of the day the first of these communications brought intelligence of a serious relapse in mr huntingdon's illness entirely the result of his own infatuation in persisting in the indulgence of his appetite for stimulating drink in vain had she remonstrated in vain she had mingled his wine with water her arguments and entreaties were a nuisance her interference was an insult so intolerable that at length on finding she had covertly diluted the pale port that was brought him he threw the bottle out of the window swearing he would not be cheated like a baby ordered the butler on pain of instant dismissal to bring a bottle of the strongest wine in the cellar and affirming that he should have been well long ago if he had been let to have his own way but she wanted to keep him weak in order that she might have him under her thumb but by the lord harry he would have no more humbug seized a glass in one hand and the bottle in the other and never rested till he had drunk it dry alarming symptoms were the immediate result of this imprudence as she mildly termed it symptoms which had rather increased than diminished since and this was the cause of her delay in writing to her brother every former feature of his malady had returned with augmented virulence the slight external wound half healed had broken out afresh internal inflammation had taken place which might terminate fatally if not soon removed of course the wretched sufferer's temper was not improved by this calamity in fact i suspect it was well-nigh insupportable though his kind nurse did not complain but she said she had been obliged at last to give her son in charge to esther hargrave as her presence was so constantly required in the sick-room that she could not possibly attend to him herself and though the child had begged to be allowed to continue with her there and to help her to nurse his papa and though she had no doubt he would have been very good and quiet she could not think of subjecting his young and tender feelings to the sight of so much suffering or of allowing him to witness his father's impatience or hear the dreadful language he was wont to use in his paroxysms of pain or irritation the latter continued she most deeply regrets the step that has occasioned his relapse but as usual he throws the blame upon me if i had reasoned with him like a rational creature he says it never would have happened 
but to be treated like a baby or a fool was enough to put any man past his patience and drive him to assert his independence even at the sacrifice of his own interest he forgets how often i had reasoned him past his patience before he appears to be sensible of his danger but nothing can induce him to behold it in the proper light the other night while i was waiting on him and just as i had brought him a draught to assuage his burning thirst he observed with a return of his former sarcastic bitterness yes you're mighty attentive now i suppose there's nothing you wouldn't do for me now you know said i a little surprised at his manner that i am willing to do anything i can to relieve you yes now my immaculate angel but when once you have secured your reward and find yourself safe in heaven and me howling in hell-fire catch you lifting a finger to serve me then no you'll look complacently on and not so much as dip the tip of your finger in water to cool my tongue if so it will be because of the great gulf over which i cannot pass and if i could look complacently on in such a case it would be only from the assurance that you were being purified from your sins and fitted to enjoy the happiness i felt but are you determined arthur that i shall not meet you in heaven <laughs> what should i do there i should like to know indeed i cannot tell and i fear it is too certain that your tastes and feelings must be widely altered before you can have any enjoyment there but do you prefer sinking without an effort into the state of torment you picture to yourself oh it's all a fable said he contemptuously are you sure arthur are you quite sure because if there is any doubt and if you should find yourself mistaken after all when it is too late to turn it would be rather awkward to be sure said he but don't bother me now i'm not going to die yet i can't and won't he added vehemently as if suddenly struck with the appalling aspect of that terrible event helen you must save me and he earnestly seized my hand and looked into my face with such imploring eagerness that my heart bled for him and i could not speak for tears the next letter brought intelligence that the malady was fast increasing and the poor sufferer's horror of death was still more distressing than his impatience of bodily pain all his friends had not forsaken him for mr hattersley hearing of his danger had come to see him from his distant home in the north his wife had accompanied him as much for the pleasure of seeing her dear friend from whom she had been parted so long as to visit her mother and sister mrs huntingdon expressed herself glad to see millicent once more and pleased to behold her so happy and well she is now at the grove continued the letter but she often calls to see me mr hattersley spends much of his time at arthur's bedside with more good feeling than i gave him credit for he evinces considerable sympathy for his unhappy friend and is far more willing than able to comfort him sometimes he tries to joke and laugh with him but that will not do sometimes he endeavors to cheer him with talk about old times and this at one time may serve to divert the sufferer from his own sad thoughts at another it will only plunge him into deeper melancholy than before and then hattersley is confounded and knows not what to say unless it be a timid suggestion that the clergyman might be sent for but arthur will never consent to that he knows he has rejected the clergyman's well-meant admonitions with scoffing levity at other times and cannot dream of turning to him for consolation now mr hattersley sometimes offers his services instead of mine but arthur will not let me go that strange whim still increases as his strength declines the fancy to have me always by his side i hardly ever leave him except to go into the next room where i sometimes snatch an hour or so of sleep when he is quiet but even then the door is left ajar that he may know me to be within call i am with him now while i write and i fear my occupation annoys him though i frequently break off to attend to him and though mr hattersley is also by his side that gentleman came as he said to beg a holiday for me that i might have a run in the park this fine frosty morning with millicent and esther and little arthur whom he had driven over to see me our poor invalid evidently felt it a heartless proposition and would have felt it still more heartless in me to accede to it i therefore said i would only go and speak to them a minute and then come back 
i did but exchange a few words with them just outside the portico inhaling the fresh bracing air as i stood and then resisting the earnest and eloquent entreaties of all three to stay a little longer and join them in a walk round the garden i tore myself away and returned to my patient i had not been absent five minutes but he reproached me bitterly for my levity and neglect his friend espoused my cause nay nay huntingdon said he you're too hard upon her she must have food and sleep and a mouthful of fresh air now and then or she can't stand it i tell you look at her man she's worn to a shadow already what are her sufferings to mine said the poor invalid you don't grudge me these attentions do you helen no arthur if i could really serve you by them i would give my life to save you if i might would you indeed no most willingly i would ah that's because you think yourself more fit to die there was a painful pause he was evidently plunged in gloomy reflections but while i pondered for something to say that might benefit without alarming him hattersley whose mind had been pursuing almost the same course broke silence with i say huntingdon i would send for a parson of some sort if you didn't like the vicar you know you could have his curate or somebody else no none of them can benefit me if she can't was the answer and the tears gushed from his eyes as he earnestly exclaimed oh helen if i had listened to you it never would have come to this and if i had heard you long ago oh god how different it would have been hear me now then arthur said i gently pressing his hand it's too late now said he despondently and after that another paroxysm of pain came on and then his mind began to wander and we feared his death was approaching but an opiate was administered his sufferings began to abate he gradually became more composed and at length sank into a kind of slumber he has been quieter since and now hattersley has left him expressing a hope that he shall find him better when he calls to-morrow perhaps i may recover he replied who knows this may have been the crisis what do you think helen unwilling to depress him i gave the most cheering answer i could but still recommended him to prepare for the possibility of what i inly feared was but too certain but he was determined to hope shortly after he relapsed into a kind of doze but now he groans again there is a change suddenly he called me to his side with such a strange excited manner that i feared he was delirious but he was not that was the crisis helen said he delightedly i had an infernal pain here it is quite gone now i never was so easy since the fall quite gone by heaven and he clasped and kissed my hand in the very fullness of his heart but finding i did not participate his joy he quickly flung it from him and bitterly cursed my coldness and insensibility how could i reply kneeling beside him i took his hand and fondly pressed it to my lips for the first time since our separation and told him as well as tears would let me speak that it was not that that kept me silent it was the fear that this sudden cessation of pain was not so favorable a symptom as he supposed i immediately sent for the doctor we are now anxiously awaiting him i will tell you what he says there is still the same freedom from pain the same deadness to all sensation where the suffering was most acute my worst feelings are realized mortification has commenced the doctor has told him there is no hope no words can describe his anguish i can write no more the next was still more distressing in the tenor of its contents the sufferer was fast approaching dissolution dragged almost to the verge of that awful chasm he trembled to contemplate from which no agony of prayers or tears could save him nothing could comfort him now hattersley's rough attempts at consolation were utterly in vain the world was nothing to him life and all its interests its petty cares and transient pleasures were a cruel mockery to talk of the past was to torture him with vain remorse to refer to the future was to increase his anguish and yet to be silent was to leave him a prey to his own regrets and apprehensions often he dwelt with shuddering minuteness on the fate of his perishing clay the slow piecemeal dissolution already invading his frame the shroud the coffin the dark lonely grave 
and all the horrors of corruption if i try said his afflicted wife to divert him from these thoughts to raise his thoughts to higher themes it is no better worse and worse he groans if there be really life beyond the tomb and judgment after death how can i face it i cannot do him any good he will neither be enlightened nor roused nor comforted by anything i say and yet he clings to me with unrelenting pertinacity with a kind of childish desperation as if i could save him from the fate he dreads he keeps me night and day beside him he is holding my left hand now while i write he has held it thus for hours sometimes quietly with his pale face upturned to mine sometimes clutching my arm with violence the big drops starting from his forehead at the thoughts of what he sees or thinks he sees before him if i withdraw my hand for a moment it distresses him stay with me helen he says let me hold you so it seems as if harm could not reach me while you are here but death will come it is coming now fast fast and oh if i could believe there was nothing after don't try to believe it arthur there is joy and glory after if you will but try to reach it what for me he said with something like a laugh are we not to be judged according to the deeds done in the body where is the use of a probationary existence if a man may spend it as he pleases just contrary to god's decrees and then go to heaven with the best if the vilest sinner may win the reward of the holiest saint by merely saying i repent but if you sincerely repent i can't repent i only fear you only regret the past for its consequences to yourself just so except that i'm sorry to have wronged you now because you're so good to me think of the goodness of god and you cannot but be grieved to have offended him what is god i cannot see him or hear him god is only an idea god is infinite wisdom and power and goodness and love but if this idea is too vast for your human faculties if your mind loses itself in its overwhelming infinitude fix it on him who condescended to take our nature upon him who was raised to heaven even in his glorified human body in whom the fullness of the godhead shines but he only shook his head and sighed then in another paroxysm of shuddering horror he tightened his grasp on my hand and arm and groaning and lamenting still clung to me with that wild desperate earnestness so harrowing to my soul because i know i cannot help him i did my best to soothe and comfort him death is so terrible he cried i cannot bear it you don't know helen you can't imagine what it is because you haven't it before you and when i'm buried you'll return to your old ways and be as happy as ever and all the world will go on just as busy and merry as if i had never been while i he burst into tears you needn't let that distress you i said we shall all follow you soon enough i wish to god i could take you with me now he exclaimed you should plead for me no man can deliver his brother nor make agreement unto god for him i replied it costs more to redeem their souls it costs the blood of an incarnate god perfect and sinless in himself to redeem us from the bondage of the evil one let him plead for you but i seem to speak in vain he does not now as formerly laugh these blessed truths to scorn but still he cannot trust or will not comprehend them he cannot linger long he suffers dreadfully and so do those that wait upon him but i will not harass you with further details i have said enough i think to convince you that i did well to go to him poor poor helen dreadful indeed her trials must have been and i could do nothing to lessen them nay it almost seemed as if i had brought them upon her myself by my own secret desires and whether i looked at her husband's sufferings or her own it seemed almost like a judgment upon myself for having cherished such a wish the next day but one there came another letter that too was put into my hands without a remark and these are its contents december fifth he is gone at last i sat beside him all night with my hand fast locked in his watching the changes of his features and listening to his failing breath 
he had been silent a long time and i thought he would never speak again when he murmured faintly but distinctly pray for me helen i do pray for you every hour and every minute arthur but you must pray for yourself his lips moved but emitted no sound then his looks became unsettled and from the incoherent half-uttered words that escaped him from time to time supposing him to be now unconscious i gently disengaged my hand from his intending to steal away for a breath of air for i was almost ready to faint but a convulsive movement of the fingers and a faintly whispered don't leave me immediately recalled me i took his hand again and held it till he was no more and then i fainted it was not grief it was exhaustion that till then i had been enabled successfully to combat oh frederick none can imagine the miseries bodily and mental of that deathbed how could i endure to think that that poor trembling soul was hurried away to everlasting torment it would drive me mad but thank god i have hope not only from a vague dependence on the possibility that penitence and pardon might have reached him at the last but from the blessed confidence that through whatever purging fires the erring spirit may be doomed to pass whatever fate awaits it still it is not lost and god who hateth nothing that he hath made will bless it in the end his body will be consigned on thursday to that dark grave he so much dreaded but the coffin must be closed as soon as possible if you will attend the funeral come quickly for i need help helen huntingdon End of Volume 3, Chapter 12 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 3, Chapter 13 Of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 3, Chapter 13 doubts and disappointments on reading this i had no reason to disguise my joy and hope from frederick lawrence for i had none to be ashamed of i felt no joy but that his sister was at length released from her afflictive overwhelming toil no hope but that she would in time recover from the effects of it and be suffered to rest in peace and quietness at least for the remainder of her life I experienced a painful commiseration for her unhappy husband, though fully aware that he had brought every particle of his sufferings upon himself, and but too well deserved them all, and a profound sympathy for her own afflictions, and deep anxiety for the consequences of those harassing cares, those dreadful vigils, that incessant and deleterious confinement beside a living corpse for i was persuaded she had not hinted half the suffering she had had to endure you will go to her lawrence said i as i put the letter into his hand yes immediately that's right i'll leave you then to prepare for your departure i've done that already while you were reading the letter and before you came and the carriage is now coming round to the door inly approving his promptitude i bade him good morning and withdrew he gave me a searching glance as we pressed each other's hands at parting but whatever he saw in my countenance he saw there nothing but the most becoming gravity it might be mingled with a little sternness and momentary resentment at what i suspected to be passing in his mind had i forgotten my own prospects my ardent love my pertinacious hopes it seemed like sacrilege to revert to them now but i had not forgotten them it was however with a gloomy sense of the darkness of those prospects the fallacy of those hopes and the vanity of that affection that i reflected on those things as i remounted my horse and slowly journeyed homewards mrs huntingdon was free now it was no longer a crime to think of her but did she ever think of me not now of course it was not to be expected but would she when this shock was over in all the course of her correspondence with her brother or mutual friend as she herself had called him she had never mentioned me but once and that was from necessity this alone afforded strong presumption that i was already forgotten yet this was not the worst 
it might have been her sense of duty that had kept her silent she might be only trying to forget but in addition to this i had a gloomy conviction that the awful realities she had seen and felt her reconciliation with the man she had once loved his dreadful sufferings and death must eventually efface from her mind all traces of her passing love for me she might recover from these horrors so far as to be restored to her former health her tranquillity her cheerfulness even but never to those feelings which would appear to her henceforth as a fleeting fancy a vain elusive dream especially as there was no one to remind her of my existence no means of assuring her of my fervent constancy now that we were so far apart and delicacy forbade me to see her or to write to her for months to come at least and how could i engage her brother in my behalf how could i break that icy crust of shy reserve perhaps he would disapprove of my attachment now as highly as before perhaps he would think me too poor too lowly born to match with his sister yes there was another barrier doubtless there was a wide distinction between the rank and circumstances of mrs huntingdon the lady of grassdale manor and those of mrs graham the artist the tenant of wildfell hall and it might be deemed presumption in me to offer my hand to the former by the world by her friends if not by herself a penalty i might brave if i were certain she loved me but otherwise how could i and finally her deceased husband with his usual selfishness might have so constructed his will as to place restrictions upon her marrying again so that you see i had reasons enough for despair if i chose to indulge it nevertheless it was with no small degree of impatience that i looked forward to mr lawrence's return from grassdale impatience that increased in proportion as his absence was prolonged he stayed away some ten or twelve days all very right that he should remain to comfort and help his sister but he might have written to tell me how she was or at least to tell me when to expect his return for he might have known i was suffering tortures of anxiety for her and uncertainty for my own future prospects and when he did return all he told me about her was that she had been greatly exhausted and worn by her unremitting exertions in behalf of that man who had been the scourge of her life and had dragged her with him nearly to the portals of the grave and was still much shaken and depressed by his melancholy end and the circumstances attendant upon it but no word in reference to me no intimation that my name had ever passed her lips or even been spoken in her presence to be sure i asked no questions on the subject i could not bring my mind to do so believing as i did that lawrence was indeed averse to the idea of my union with his sister i saw that he expected to be further questioned concerning his visit and i saw too with a keen perception of awakened jealousy or alarmed self-esteem or by whatever name i ought to call it that he rather shrank from that impending scrutiny and was no less pleased than surprised to find it did not come of course i was burning with anger but pride obliged me to suppress my feelings and preserve a smooth face or at least a stoic calmness throughout the interview it was well it did for reviewing the matter in my sober judgment i must say it would have been highly absurd and improper to have quarrelled with him on such an occasion i must confess too that i wronged him in my heart the truth is he liked me very well but he was fully aware that a union between mrs huntingdon and me would be what the world calls a mesalliance and it was not in his nature to set the world at defiance especially in such a case as this for its dread laugh or ill opinion would be far more terrible to him directed against his sister than himself had he believed that a union was necessary to the happiness of both or of either or had he known how fervently i loved her he would have acted differently but seeing me so calm and cool he would not for the world disturb my philosophy and though refraining entirely from any active opposition to the match he would yet do nothing to bring it about and would much rather take the part of prudence in aiding us to overcome our mutual predilections than that of feeling to encourage them and he was in the right of it you will say perhaps he was 
at any rate i had no business to feel so bitterly against him as i did but i could not then regard the matter in such a moderate light and after a brief conversation upon indifferent topics i went away suffering all the pangs of wounded pride and injured friendship in addition to those resulting from the fear that i was indeed forgotten and the knowledge that she i loved was alone and afflicted suffering from injured health and dejected spirits and i was forbidden to console or assist her forbidden even to assure her of my sympathy for the transmission of any such message through mr lawrence was now completely out of the question but what should i do i would wait and see if she would notice me which of course she would not unless by some kind message entrusted to her brother that in all probability he would not deliver and then dreadful thought she would think me cooled and changed for not returning it or perhaps he had already given her to understand that i had ceased to think of her i would wait however till the six months after our parting were fairly past which would be about the close of february and then i would send her a letter modestly reminding her of her former permission to write to her at the close of that period and hoping i might avail myself of it at least to express my heartfelt sorrow for her late afflictions my just appreciation of her generous conduct and my hope that her health was now completely re-established and that she would some time be permitted to enjoy those blessings of a peaceful happy life which had been denied her so long but which none could more truly be said to merit than herself adding a few words of kind remembrance to my little friend arthur with a hope that he had not forgotten me and perhaps a few more in reference to bygone times to the delightful hours i had passed in her society and my unfading recollection of them which was the salt and solace of my life and a hope that her recent troubles had not entirely banished me from her mind if she did not answer this of course i should write no more if she did as surely she would in some fashion my future proceedings should be regulated by her reply ten weeks was long to wait in such a miserable state of uncertainty but courage it must be endured and meantime i would continue to see lawrence now and then though not so often as before and i would still pursue my habitual enquiries after his sister if he had lately heard from her and how she was but nothing more i did so and the answers i received were always provokingly limited to the letter of the enquiry she was much as usual she made no complaints but the tone of her last letter evinced great depression of mind she said she was better and finally she said she was well and very busy with her son's education and with the management of her late husband's property and the regulation of his affairs the rascal had never told me how that property was disposed or whether mr huntingdon had died intestate or not and i would sooner die than ask him lest he should misconstrue into covetousness my desire to know he never offered to show me his sister's letters now and i never hinted a wish to see them february however was approaching december was past january at length was almost over a few more weeks and then certain despair or renewal of hope would put an end to this long agony of suspense but alas it was just about that time she was called to sustain another blow in the death of her uncle a worthless old fellow enough in himself i dare say but he had always shown more kindness and affection to her than to any other creature and she had always been accustomed to regard him as a parent she was with him when he died and had assisted her aunt to nurse him during the last stage of his illness her brother went to staningley to attend the funeral and told me upon his return that she was still there endeavouring to cheer her aunt with her presence and likely to remain some time this was bad news for me for while she continued there i could not write to her as i did not know the address and would not ask it of him but week followed week and every time i inquired about her she was still at staningley where is staningley i asked at last in blankshire was the brief reply and there was something so cold and dry in the manner of it that i was effectually deterred from requesting a more definite account when will she return to grassdale was my next question 
I don't know. Confound it, I muttered. Why, Markham? asked my companion, with an air of innocent surprise. But I did not deign to answer him, save by a look of silent, sullen contempt, at which he turned away and contemplated the carpet with a slight smile, half pensive, half amused. But quickly looking up, he began to talk of other subjects, trying to draw me into a cheerful and friendly conversation. But I was too much irritated to discourse with him, and soon took leave. You see, Lawrence and I somehow could not manage to get on very well together. The fact is, I believe, we were both of us a little too touchy. It is a troublesome thing, Halford, this susceptibility to affronts where none are intended. I am no martyr to it now, as you can bear me witness. I have learned to be merry and wise, to be more easy with myself and more indulgent to my neighbors, and I can afford to laugh at both Lawrence and you. Partly from accident, partly from willful negligence on my part, for I was really beginning to dislike him, several weeks elapsed before I saw my friend again. When we did meet, it was he that sought me out. One bright morning, early in June, he came into the field where I was just commencing my hay harvest. It is long since I saw you, Markham, said he, after the first few words had passed between us. You never mean to come to Woodford again. I called once, and you were out. I was sorry, but that was long since. I hoped you would call again. And now I have called, and you were out, which you generally are, or I would do myself the pleasure of calling more frequently. But being determined to see you this time, I have left my pony in the lane and come over hedge and ditch to join you, for I am about to leave Woodford for a while, and may not have the pleasure of seeing you again for a month or two. Where are you going? To Grassdale first, said he, with a half-smile he would willingly have suppressed if he could. To Grassdale? Is she there, then? Yes, but in a day or two she will leave it to accompany Mrs. Maxwell to F for the benefit of the sea air, and I shall go with them. F was at that time a quiet but respectable watering place. It is considerably more frequented now. Lawrence seemed to expect me to take advantage of this circumstance to entrust him with some sort of a message to his sister, and I believe he would have undertaken to deliver it without any material objections if I had had the sense to ask him, though of course he would not offer to do so if I was content to let it alone. But I could not bring myself to make the request, and it was not till after he was gone that I saw how fair an opportunity I had lost and then, indeed, I deeply regretted my stupidity and my foolish pride. But it was now too late to remedy the evil. He did not return till towards the latter end of August. He wrote to me twice or thrice from F., but his letters were most provokingly unsatisfactory, dealing in generalities or in trifles that I cared nothing about, or replete with fancies and reflections equally unwelcome to me at the time saying next to nothing about his sister and little more about himself. I would wait, however, till he came back. Perhaps I could get something more out of him then. At all events, I would not write to her now while she was with him and her aunt, who doubtless would be still more hostile to my presumptuous aspirations than himself. When she was returned to the silence and solitude of her own home, it would be my fittest opportunity. When Lawrence came, however, he was as reserved as ever on the subject of my keen anxiety. He told me that his sister had derived considerable benefit from her stay at F., that her son was quite well, and, alas, that both of them were gone with Mrs. Maxwell back to Staningley, and there they stayed at least three months. But instead of boring you with my chagrin, my expectations and disappointments, my fluctuations of dull despondency and flickering hope, my varying resolutions, now to drop it and now to persevere, now to make a bold push, and now to let things pass and patiently abide my time, I will employ myself in settling the business of one or two of the characters introduced in the course of this narrative, whom I may not have occasion to mention again. Some time before Mr. Huntington's death, Lady Lowborough eloped with another gallant to the continent, where, having lived a while in reckless gaiety and dissipation, they quarrelled and parted. 
she went dashing on for a season but years came and money went she sunk at length in difficulty and debt disgrace and misery and died at last as i have heard in penury neglect and utter wretchedness but this might be only a report she may be living yet for anything i or any of her relatives or former acquaintances can tell for they have all lost sight of her long years ago and would as thoroughly forget her if they could her husband however upon this second misdemeanor immediately sought and obtained a divorce and not long after married again it was well he did for lord lowborough morose and moody as he seemed was not the man for a bachelor's life no public interests no ambitious projects or active pursuits or ties of friendship even if he had had any friends could compensate to him for the absence of domestic comforts and endearments he had a son and a nominal daughter it is true but they too painfully reminded him of their mother and the unfortunate little annabella was a source of perpetual bitterness to his soul he had obliged himself to treat her with paternal kindness he had forced himself not to hate her and even perhaps to feel some degree of kindly regard for her at last in return for her artless and unsuspecting attachment to himself but the bitterness of his self-condemnation for his inward feelings towards that innocent being his constant struggles to subdue the evil promptings of his nature for it was not a generous one though partly guessed at by those who knew him could be known to god in his own heart alone so also was the hardness of his conflicts with the temptation to return to the vice of his youth and seek oblivion for past calamities and deadness to the present misery of a blighted heart a joyless friendless life and a morbidly disconsolate mind by yielding again to that insidious foe to health and sense and virtue which had so deplorably enslaved and degraded him before the second object of his choice was widely different from the first some wondered at his taste some even ridiculed it but in this their folly was more apparent than his the lady was about his own age that is between thirty and forty remarkable neither for beauty nor wealth nor brilliant accomplishments nor any other thing that i ever heard of except genuine good sense unswerving integrity active piety warm-hearted benevolence and a fund of cheerful spirits these qualities however as you may readily imagine combined to render her an excellent mother to the children and an invaluable wife to his lordship he with his usual self-depreciation or appreciation thought her a world too good for him and while he wondered at the kindness of providence in conferring such a gift upon him and even at her taste in preferring him to other men he did his best to reciprocate the good she did him and so far succeeded that she was and i believe still is one of the happiest and fondest wives in england and all who question the good taste of either partner may be thankful if their respective selections afford them half the genuine satisfaction in the end or repay their preference with affection half as lasting and sincere if you are at all interested in the fate of that low scoundrel grimsby i can only tell you that he went from bad to worse sinking from bathos to bathos of vice and villainy consorting only with the worst members of his club and the lowest dregs of society happily for the rest of the world and at last met his end in a drunken brawl from the hands it is said of some brother scoundrel he had cheated at play as for mr hattersley he had never wholly forgotten his resolution to come out from among them and behave like a man and a christian and the last illness and death of his once jolly friend huntingdon so deeply and seriously impressed him with the evil of their former practices that he never needed another lesson of the kind avoiding the temptations of the town he continued to pass his life in the country immersed in the usual pursuits of a hardy active country gentleman his occupations being those of farming and breeding horses and cattle diversified with a little hunting and shooting and enlivened by the occasional companionship of his friends better friends than those of his youth and the society of his happy little wife now cheerful and confiding as heart could wish 
and his fine family of stalwart sons and blooming daughters his father the banker having died some years ago and left him all his riches he has now full scope for the exercise of his prevailing tastes and i need not tell you that ralph hattersley esq is celebrated throughout the country for his noble breed of horses end of volume three chapter thirteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume three chapter fourteen of the tenant of wildfell hall by anne bronte this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume three chapter fourteen an unexpected occurrence we will now turn to a certain still cold cloudy afternoon about the commencement of december when the first fall of snow lay thinly scattered over the blighted fields and frozen roads or stored more thickly in the hollows of the deep cart ruts and footsteps of men and horses impressed in the now petrified mire of last month's drenching rains i remember it well for i was walking home from the vicarage with no less remarkable a personage than miss eliza millward by my side i had been to call upon her father a sacrifice to civility undertaken entirely to please my mother not myself for i hated to go near the house not merely on account of my antipathy to the once so bewitching eliza but because i had not half forgiven the old gentleman himself for his ill opinion of mrs huntingdon for though now constrained to acknowledge himself mistaken in his former judgment he still maintained that she had done wrong to leave her husband it was a violation of her sacred duties as a wife and attempting of providence by laying herself open to temptation and nothing short of bodily ill usage and that of no trifling nature could excuse such a step nor even that for in such a case she ought to appeal to the laws for protection but it was not of him i intended to speak it was of his daughter eliza just as i was taking leave of the vicar she entered the room ready equipped for a walk i was just coming to see your sister mr markham said she and so if you have no objection i'll accompany you home i like company when i'm walking out don't you yes when it's agreeable that of course rejoined the young lady smiling archly so we proceeded together shall i find rose at home do you think said she as we closed the garden gate and set our faces towards linden car i believe so i trust i shall for i have a little bit of news for her if you haven't forestalled me i yes do you know what mr lawrence has gone for she looked up anxiously for my reply is he gone said i and her face brightened ah then he hasn't told you about his sister what of her i demanded in terror lest some evil should have befallen her oh mr markham how you blush cried she with a tormenting laugh ha <laughs> ha you have not forgotten her yet but you had better be quick about it i can tell you for alas alas she's going to be married next thursday no miss eliza that's false do you charge me with a falsehood sir you are misinformed am i do you know better then i think i do what makes you look so pale then said she smiling with delight at my emotion is it anger at poor me for telling such a fib well i only tell the tale as twas told to me i don't vouch for the truth of it but at the same time i don't see what reason sarah should have for deceiving me or her informant for deceiving her and that was what she told me the footman told her that mrs huntingdon was going to be married on thursday and mr lawrence was gone to the wedding she did tell me the name of the gentleman but i've forgotten that perhaps you can assist me to remember it is there not some one that lives near or frequently visits the neighbourhood that has long been attached to her a mr oh dear mr hargrave suggested i with a bitter smile you're right cried she that was the very name impossible miss eliza i exclaimed in a tone that made her start well 
you know that's what they told me said she composedly staring me in the face and then she broke out into a long shrill laugh that put me to my wit's end with fury really you must excuse me cried she i know it's very rude but did you think to marry her yourself dear dear what a pity <laughs> oh gracious mr markham are you going to faint oh mercy shall i call this man here jacob but checking the word on her lips i seized her arm and gave it i think a pretty severe squeeze for she shrank into herself with a faint cry of pain or terror but the spirit within her was not subdued instantly rallying she continued with well-feigned concern what can i do for you will you have some water some brandy i dare say they have some in the public-house down there if you'll let me run have done with this nonsense cried i sternly she looked confounded almost frightened again for a moment you know i hate such jests i continued jests indeed i wasn't jesting you were laughing at all events and i don't like to be laughed at returned i making violent efforts to speak with proper dignity and composure and to say nothing but what was coherent and sensible and since you are in such a merry mood miss eliza you must be good enough company for yourself and therefore i shall leave you to finish your walk alone for now i think of it i have business elsewhere so good evening with that i left her smothering her malicious laughter and turned aside into the fields springing up the bank and pushing through the nearest gap in the hedge determined at once to prove the truth or rather the falsehood of her story i hastened to woodford as fast as my legs could carry me first veering round by a circuitous course but the moment i was out of sight of my fair tormentor cutting away across the country just as a bird might fly over pasture land and fallow and stubble and lane clearing hedges and ditches and hurdles till i came to the young squire's gates never till now had i known the full fervour of my love the full strength of my hopes not wholly crushed even in my hours of deepest despondency always tenaciously clinging to the thought that one day she might be mine or if not that at least that something of my memory some slight remembrance of our friendship and our love would be forever cherished in her heart i marched up to the door determined if i saw the master to question him boldly concerning his sister to wait and hesitate no longer but cast false delicacy and stupid pride behind my back and know my fate at once is mr lawrence at home i eagerly asked of the servant that opened the door no sir master went yesterday replied he looking very alert went where to grassdale sir wasn't you aware sir he's very close is master said the fellow with a foolish simpering grin i suppose sir but i turned and left him without waiting to hear what he supposed i was not going to stand there to expose my tortured feelings to the insolent laughter and impertinent curiosity of a fellow like that but what was to be done now could it be possible that she had left me for that man i could not believe it me she might forsake but not to give herself to him well i would know the truth to no concerns of daily life could i attend while this tempest of doubt and dread of jealousy and rage distracted me i would take the morning coach from l the evening one would be already gone and fly to grassdale i must be there before the marriage and why because a thought struck me that perhaps i might prevent it that if i did not she and i might both lament it to the latest moment of our lives it struck me that someone might have belied me to her perhaps her brother yes no doubt her brother had persuaded her that i was false and faithless and taking advantage of her natural indignation and perhaps her desponding carelessness about her future life had urged her artfully cruelly on to this other marriage in order to secure her from me if this was the case and if she should only discover her mistake when too late to repair it to what a life of misery and vain regret might she be doomed as well as me and what remorse for me to think my foolish scruples had induced it all oh i must see her she must know my truth even if i told it at the church door i might pass for a madman or an impertinent fool 
even she might be offended at such an interruption or at least might tell me it was now too late but if i could save her if she might be mine it was too rapturous a thought winged by this hope and goaded by these fears i hurried homewards to prepare for my departure on the morrow i told my mother that urgent business which admitted no delay but which i could not then explain called me away to blank the last large town through which i had to pass my deep anxiety and serious preoccupation could not be concealed from her maternal eyes and i had much ado to calm her apprehensions of some disastrous mystery that night there came a heavy fall of snow which so retarded the progress of the coaches on the following day that i was almost driven to distraction i travelled all night of course for this was wednesday to-morrow morning doubtless the marriage would take place but the night was long and dark the snow heavily clogged the wheels and balled the horses feet the animals were consumedly lazy the coachman most execrably cautious the passengers confoundedly apathetic in their supine indifference to the rate of our progression instead of assisting me to bully the several coachmen and urge them forward they merely stared and grinned at my impatience one fellow even ventured to rally me upon it but i silenced him with a look that quelled him for the rest of the journey and when at the last stage i would have taken the reins into my own hands they all with one accord opposed it it was broad daylight when we entered m and drew up at the rose and crown i alighted and called aloud for a post-chaise to grassdale there was none to be had the only one in the town was under repair a gig then a fly car anything only be quick there was a gig but not a horse to spare i sent into the town to seek one but there was such an intolerable time about it that i could wait no longer i thought my own feet could carry me sooner and bidding them send the confounded conveyance after me if it were ready within an hour i set off as fast as i could walk the distance was little more than six miles but the road was strange and i had to keep stopping to inquire my way hallooing to carters and clodhoppers and frequently invading the cottages for there were few abroad that winter's morning sometimes knocking up the lazy people from their beds for where so little work was to be done perhaps so little food and fire to be had they cared not to curtail their slumbers i had no time to think of them however aching with weariness and desperation i hurried on the gig did not overtake me it was well i had not waited for it vexatious rather that i had been fool enough to wait so long at length however i entered the neighbourhood of grassdale i approached the little rural church but lo there stood a train of carriages before it it needed not the white favours bedecking the servants and horses nor the merry voices of the village idlers assembled to witness the show to apprise me that there was a wedding within i ran in among them demanding with breathless eagerness had the ceremony long commenced they only gaped and stared in my desperation i pushed past them and was about to enter the churchyard gate when a group of ragged urchins that had been hanging like bees to the windows suddenly dropped off and made a rush for the porch vociferating in the uncouth dialect of their country something which signified it's over they're coming out if eliza millward had seen me then she might indeed have been delighted i grasped the gatepost for support and stood intently gazing towards the door to take my last look on my soul's delight my first on that detested mortal who had torn her from my heart and doomed her i was certain to a life of misery and hollow vain repining for what happiness could she enjoy with him i did not wish to shock her with my presence now but i had not power to move away forth came the bride and bridegroom him i saw not i had eyes for none but her a long veil shrouded half her graceful form but did not hide it i could see that while she carried her head erect her eyes were bent upon the ground and her face and neck were suffused with a crimson blush but every feature was radiant with smiles and gleaming through the misty whiteness of her veil were clusters of golden ringlets oh heavens it was not my helen the first glimpse made me start but my eyes were darkened with exhaustion and despair dare i trust them 
yes it is not she it was a younger slighter rosier beauty lovely indeed but with far less dignity and depth of soul without that indefinable grace that keenly spiritual yet gentle charm that ineffable power to attract and subjugate the heart my heart at least i looked at the bridegroom it was frederick lawrence i wiped away the cold drops that were trickling down my forehead and stepped back as he approached but his eye fell upon me and he knew me altered as my appearance must have been is that you markham said he startled and confounded at the apparition perhaps too at the wildness of my looks yes lawrence is that you i mustered the presence of mind to reply he smiled and colored as if half proud and half ashamed of his identity and if he had reason to be proud of the sweet lady on his arm he had no less cause to be ashamed of having concealed his good fortune so long allow me to introduce you to my bride said he endeavouring to hide his embarrassment by an assumption of careless gaiety esther this is mr markham my friend markham mrs lawrence late miss hargrave i bowed to the bride and vehemently wrung the bridegroom's hand why did you not tell me of this i said reproachfully pretending a resentment i did not feel for in truth i was almost wild with joy to find myself so happily mistaken and overflowing with affection to him for this and for the base injustice i felt that i had done him in my mind he might have wronged me but not to that extent and as i had hated him like a demon for the last forty hours the reaction from such a feeling was so great that i could pardon all offences for the moment and love him in spite of them too i did tell you said he with an air of guilty confusion you received my letter what letter the one announcing my intended marriage i never received the most distant hint of such an intention it must have crossed you on your way then it should have reached you yesterday morning it was rather late i acknowledge but what brought you here then if you received no information it was now my turn to be confounded but the young lady who had been busily patting the snow with her foot during our short sotto voce colloquy very opportunely came to my assistance by pinching her companion's arm and whispering a suggestion that his friend should be invited to step into the carriage and go with them it being scarcely agreeable to stand there among so many gazers and keeping their friends waiting into the bargain and so cold as it is too said he glancing with dismay at her slight drapery and immediately handing her into the carriage markham will you come we are going to paris but we can drop you anywhere between this and dover no thank you good-bye i needn't wish you a pleasant journey but i shall expect a very handsome apology some time mind and scores of letters before we meet again he shook my hand and hastened to take his place beside his lady this was no time or place for explanation or discourse we had already stood long enough to excite the wonder of the village sightseers and perhaps the wrath of the attendant bridal party though of course all this passed in a much shorter time than i have taken to relate or even than you will take to read it i stood beside the carriage and the window being down i saw my happy friend fondly encircle his companion's waist with his arm while she rested her glowing cheek on his shoulder looking the very impersonation of loving trusting bliss in the interval between the footman's closing the door and taking his place behind she raised her smiling brown eyes to his face observing playfully i fear you must think me very insensible frederick i know it is the custom for ladies to cry on these occasions but i couldn't squeeze a tear for my life he only answered with a kiss and pressed her still closer to his bosom but what is this he murmured why esther you're crying now oh it's nothing it's only too much happiness and the wish sobbed she that our dear helen were as happy as ourselves bless you for that wish i inwardly responded as the carriage rolled away and heaven grant it be not wholly vain i thought a cloud had suddenly darkened her husband's face as she spoke what did he think could he grudge such happiness to his dear sister and his friend as he now felt himself at such a moment it was impossible 
the contrast between her fate and his must darken his bliss for a time perhaps too he thought of me perhaps he regretted the part he had had in preventing our union by omitting to help us if not by actually plotting against us i exonerated him from that charge now and deeply lamented my former ungenerous suspicions but he had wronged us still i hoped i trusted that he had he had not attempted to check the course of our love by actually damming up the streams in their passage but he had passively watched the two currents wandering through life's arid wilderness declining to clear away the obstructions that divided them and secretly hoping that both would lose themselves in the sand before they could be joined in one and meantime he had been quietly proceeding with his own affairs perhaps his heart and head had been so full of his fair lady that he had had but little thought to spare for others doubtless he had made his first acquaintance with her his first intimate acquaintance at least during his three months sojourn at f for i now recollected that he had once casually let fall an intimation that his aunt and sister had a young friend staying with them at the time and this accounted for at least one half his silence about all transactions there now too i saw a reason for many little things that had slightly puzzled me before among the rest for sundry departures from woodford and absences more or less prolonged for which he never satisfactorily accounted and concerning which he hated to be questioned on his return well might the servant say his master was very close but why this strange reserve to me partly from that remarkable idiosyncrasy to which i have before alluded partly perhaps from tenderness to my feelings or fear to disturb my philosophy by touching upon the infectious theme of love end of volume three chapter fourteen Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 3, Chapter 15 of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 3, Chapter 15 Fluctuations the tardy gig had overtaken me at last i entered it and bade the man who brought it drive to grassdale manor i was too busy with my own thoughts to care to drive it myself i would see mrs huntingdon there could be no impropriety in that now that her husband had been dead above a year and by her indifference or her joy at my unexpected arrival i could soon tell whether her heart was truly mine but my companion a loquacious forward fellow was not disposed to leave me to the indulgence of my private cogitations there they go said he as the carriages filed away before us there'll be brave doings on yonder to-day as what come to-morrow know anything of that family sir or you're a stranger in these parts i know them by report humph <laughs> there's the best of em gone anyhow and i suppose the old missus is a-going to leave after this stir's gotten overed and take herself off somewhere to live on her own bit of a jointure and the young un at least the new un she's none so very young is coming down to live at the grove is mr hargrave married then ay sir a few months since he should have been wed afore to a widow lady they couldn't agree over the money she'd a rare long purse and mr hargrave wanted it all to hisself but she wouldn't let it go and so then they fell out this one isn't quite as rich nor as handsome either but she hasn't been married before she's very plain they say getting on to forty or past and so you know if she didn't jump at this opportunity she thought she'd never get a better i guess she thought such a handsome young husband was worth all that she ever had and he might take it in welcome but i lay she'll rue her bargain afore long they say she begins already to see it he isn't altogether that nice generous polite delightful gentleman that she thought him afore marriage he begins a being careless and masterful already Aye and she'll find him harder and carelesser nor she thinks on you seem to be well acquainted with him i observed i am sir i've known him since he was quite a young gentleman and a proud one he was and a wilful i was servant yonder for several years but i couldn't stand their niggardly ways she got ever longer and worse did missus with her nipping and screwing and watching and grudging so i thought i'd find another place as what came 
and then he discoursed upon his present position as ostler at the rose and crown and how greatly superior it was to his former one in comfort and freedom though inferior in outward respectability and entered into various details respecting the domestic economy at the grove and the characters of mrs hargrave and her son to which i gave no heed being too much occupied with my own anxious fluttering anticipations and with the character of the country through which we passed that in spite of the leafless trees and snowy ground had for some time begun to manifest unequivocal signs of the approach to a gentleman's country seat are we not near the house said i interrupting him in the middle of his discourse yes sir yon's the park my heart sank within me to behold that stately mansion in the midst of its expansive grounds the park is beautiful now in its wintry garb as it could be in its summer glory the majestic sweep the undulating swell and fall displayed to full advantage in that robe of dazzling purity stainless and printless save one long winding track left by the trooping deer the stately timber trees with their heavy laden branches gleaming white against the dull grey sky the deep encircling woods the broad expanse of water sleeping in frozen quiet and the weeping ash and willow drooping their snow-clad boughs above it all presented a picture striking indeed and pleasing to an unencumbered mind but by no means encouraging to me there was one comfort however all this was entailed upon little arthur and could not under any circumstances strictly speaking be his mother's but how was she situated overcoming with a sudden effort my repugnance to mention her name to my garrulous companion i asked him if he knew whether her late husband had left a will and how the property had been disposed of oh yes he knew all about it and i was quickly informed that to her had been left the full control and management of the estate during her son's minority besides the absolute unconditional possession of her own fortune but i knew her father had not given her much and the small additional sum that had been settled upon her before marriage before the close of the explanation we drew up at the park gates now for the trial if i should find her within but alas she might be still at stainingly her brother had given me no intimation to the contrary i inquired at the porter's lodge if mrs huntingdon were at home no she was with her aunt in blankshire but was expected to return before christmas she usually spent most of her time at stainingly only coming to grassdale occasionally when the management of affairs or the interest of her tenants and dependents required her presence near what town is stainingly situated i asked the requisite information was soon obtained now then my man give me the reins and we'll return to m i must have some breakfast at the rose and crown and then away to stainingly by the first coach for blank you'll not get there to-day sir no matter i don't want to get there to-day i want to get there to-morrow and pass the night on the road at an inn sir you'd better by half stay at our house and then start fresh to-morrow and have the whole day for your journey what and lose twelve hours not i perhaps sir you're related to mrs huntingdon said he seeking to indulge his curiosity since his cupidity was not to be gratified i have not that honour ah well returned he with a dubious sidelong glance at my splashed grey trousers and rough pea-jacket but he added encouragingly there's many a fine lady like that has kinfolk poorer nor what you are sir i should think no doubt and there's many a fine gentleman would esteem himself vastly honoured to be able to claim kindred with the lady you mention he now cunningly glanced at my face perhaps sir you mean to i guessed what was coming and checked the impertinent conjecture with perhaps you'll be so good as to be quiet a moment i'm busy busy sir yes in my mind and don't want to have my cogitations disturbed indeed sir you will see that my disappointment had not very greatly affected me or i should not have been able so quietly to bear with the fellow's impertinence the fact is i thought it as well nay better all things considered that i should not see her to-day that i should have time to compose my mind for the interview to prepare it for a heavier disappointment after the intoxicating delight experienced by this sudden removal of my former apprehensions not to mention that after travelling a night and a day without intermission 
and rushing in hot haste through six miles of new-fallen snow, I could not possibly be in a very presentable condition. At M I had time before the coach started to replenish my forces with a hearty breakfast, and to obtain the refreshment of my usual morning's ablutions and the amelioration of some slight change in my toilette and also to dispatch a short note to my mother, excellent son that I was, to assure her that I was still in existence, and to excuse my non-appearance at the expected time. It was a long journey to Staningley for those slow travelling days, but I did not deny myself needful refreshment on the road, nor even a night's rest at a wayside inn, choosing rather to brook a little delay than to present myself worn, wild, and weather-beaten before my mistress and her aunt, who would be astonished enough to see me without that. Next morning, therefore, I not only fortified myself with as substantial a breakfast as my excited feelings would allow me to swallow, but I bestowed a little more than usual time and care upon my toilette, and furnished with a change of linen from my small carpet-bag, well-brushed clothes, well-polished boots, and neat new gloves, I mounted the lightning and resumed my journey. I had nearly two stages yet before me, but the coach, I was informed, passed through the neighbourhood of Staningley, and having desired to be set down as near the hall as possible, I had nothing to do but to sit with folded arms and speculate upon the coming hour. It was a clear, frosty morning. The very fact of sitting exalted aloft, surveying the snowy landscape and sweet sunny sky, inhaling the pure bracing air, and crunching away over the crisp frozen snow, was exhilarating enough in itself, but add to this the idea of to what goal I was hastening, and whom I expected to meet, and you may have some faint conception of my frame of mind at the time, only a faint one, though, for my heart swelled with unspeakable delight, and my spirits rose almost to madness, in spite of my prudent endeavours to bind them down to a reasonable platitude, by thinking of the undeniable difference between Helen's rank and mine of all that she had passed through since our parting, of her long unbroken silence, and above all, of her cool, cautious aunt, whose counsels she would doubtless be careful not to slight again. These considerations made my heart flutter with anxiety, and my chest heave with impatience to get the crisis over. But they could not dim her image in my mind, or mar the vivid recollection of what had been said and felt between us, or destroy the keen anticipation of what was to be. In fact, I could not realize their terrors now. Towards the close of the journey, however, a couple of my fellow passengers kindly came to my assistance and brought me low enough. Fine land, this, said one of them, pointing with his umbrella to the wide fields on the right, conspicuous for their compact hedgerows, deep well-cut ditches, and fine timber trees, growing sometimes on the borders, sometimes in the midst of the enclosure very fine land if you saw it in the summer or spring i responded the other a gruff elderly man with a drab greatcoat buttoned up to the chin and a cotton umbrella between his knees it's old maxwell's i suppose it was his sir but he's dead now you're aware and has left it all to his niece all oh, every root of it and the mansion house and all every atom of his worldly goods except just a trifle by way of remembrance to his nephew down in blankshire and an annuity to his wife it's strange sir it is sir and she wasn't his own niece neither but he had no near relations of his own none but a nephew he'd quarrelled with and he always had a partiality for this one and then his wife advised him to it they say she'd brought most of the property and it was her wish that this lady should have it hm. she'll be a fine cat for somebody she will so. She's a widow, but quite young yet, and uncommon handsome, a fortune of her own besides, and only one child, and she's nursing a fine estate for him in blank. There'll be lots to speak for her. Afraid there's no chance for us, facetiously jogging me with his elbow, as well as his companion. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, no offense, sir, I hope, to me. <clears throat> I should think she'll marry none but a nobleman myself. Look ye, sir, resumed he, turning to his other neighbor and pointing past me with his umbrella that's the hall grand park you see and all them woods plenty of timber there and lots of game hello what now this exclamation was occasioned by the sudden stoppage of the coach at the park gates 
gentlemen for Staningley Hall, cried the coachman, and I rose and threw my carpet bag on to the ground, preparatory to dropping myself down after it. Sickly, sir, asked my talkative neighbour, staring me in the face. I dare say it was white enough. No. Here, coachman. Thank you, sir. All right. The coachman pocketed his fee and drove away, leaving me not walking up the park, but pacing to and fro before its gates with folded arms and eyes fixed upon the ground an overwhelming force of images thoughts impressions crowding on my mind and nothing tangibly distinct but this my love had been cherished in vain my hope was gone forever i must tear myself away at once and banish or suppress all thoughts of her like the remembrance of a wild mad dream gladly would i have lingered round the place for hours in the hope of catching at least one distant glimpse of her before i went but it must not be i must not suffer her to see me but what could have brought me hither but the hope of reviving her attachment with a view hereafter to obtain her hand and could i bear that she should think me capable of such a thing of presuming upon the acquaintance the love if you will accidentally contracted or rather forced upon her against her will when she was an unknown fugitive toiling for her own support apparently without fortune family or connections to come upon her now when she was reinstated in her proper sphere and claim a share in her prosperity which had it never failed her would most certainly have kept her unknown to me for ever and this too when we had parted sixteen months ago and she had expressly forbidden me to hope for a reunion in this world and never sent me a line or a message from that day to this no the very idea was intolerable and even if she should have a lingering affection for me still ought i to disturb her peace by awakening those feelings to subject her to the struggles of conflicting duty and inclination to whichsoever side the latter might allure or the former imperatively call her whether she should deem it her duty to risk the slights and censures of the world the sorrow and displeasure of those she loved for a romantic idea of truth and constancy to me or to sacrifice her individual wishes to the feelings of her friends and her own sense of prudence and the fitness of things no and i would not i would go at once and she should never know that i had approached the place of her abode for though i might disclaim all idea of ever aspiring to her hand or even of soliciting a place in her friendly regard her peace should not be broken by my presence nor her heart afflicted by the sight of my fidelity adieu then dear helen for ever for ever adieu so said i and yet i could not tear myself away i moved a few paces and then looked back for one last view of her stately home that i might have its outward form at least impressed upon my mind as indelibly as her own image which alas i must not see again then walked a few steps farther and then lost in melancholy musings paused again and leant my back against a rough old tree that grew beside the road. End of Volume 3, Chapter 15 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 3, Chapter 16 Of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 3, Chapter 16, Conclusion While standing thus, absorbed in my gloomy reverie, a gentleman's carriage came round the corner of the road. I did not look at it, and had it rolled quietly by me, I should not have remembered the fact of its appearance at all but a tiny voice from within it roused me by exclaiming mamma mamma there's mr markham i did not hear the reply but presently the same voice answered it is indeed mamma look for yourself i did not raise my eyes but i suppose mamma looked for a clear melodious voice whose tones thrilled through my nerves exclaimed oh aunt here's mr markham arthur's friend stop richard there was such evidence of joyous though suppressed excitement in the utterance of those few words especially that tremulous oh aunt that it threw me almost off my guard the carriage stopped immediately and i looked up 
and met the eye of a pale grave elderly lady surveying me from the open window she bowed and so did i and then she withdrew her head while arthur screamed to the footman to let him out but before that functionary could descend from his box a hand was silently put forth from the carriage window i knew that hand though a black glove concealed its delicate whiteness and half its fair proportions and quickly seizing it i pressed it in my own ardently for a moment but instantly recollecting myself i dropped it and it was immediately withdrawn were you coming to see us or only passing by asked the low voice of its owner who i felt was attentively surveying my countenance from behind the thick black veil which with the shadowing panels entirely concealed her own from me i i came to see the place faltered i the place repeated she in a tone which betokened more displeasure or disappointment than surprise will you not enter it then if you wish it can you doubt yes yes he must enter cried arthur running round from the other door and seizing my hand in both his he shook it heartily do you remember me sir said he oh yes full well my little man altered though you are replied i surveying the comparatively tall slim young gentleman with his mother's image visibly stamped upon his fair intelligent features in spite of the blue eyes beaming with gladness and the bright locks clustering beneath his cap am i not grown said he stretching himself up to his full height grown three inches upon my word i was seven last birthday was the proud rejoinder in seven years more i shall be as tall as you nearly arthur said his mother tell him to come in go on richard there was a touch of sadness as well as coldness in her voice but i knew not to what to ascribe it the carriage drove on and entered the gates before us my little companion led me up the park discoursing merrily all the way arrived at the hall door i paused on the steps and looked round me waiting to recover my composure if possible or at any rate to remember my new formed resolutions and the principles on which they were founded and it was not till arthur had been for some time gently pulling my coat and repeating his invitations to enter that i at length consented to accompany him into the apartment where the ladies awaited us helen eyed me as i entered with a kind of gentle serious scrutiny and politely asked after mrs markham and rose i respectfully answered her inquiries mrs maxwell begged me to be seated observing it was rather cold but she supposed i had not travelled far that morning not quite twenty miles i answered not on foot no madam by coach here's rachel sir said arthur the only truly happy one amongst us directing my attention to that worthy individual who had just entered to take her mistress's things she vouchsafed me an almost friendly smile of recognition a favour that demanded at least a civil salutation on my part which was accordingly given and respectively returned she had seen the error of her former estimation of my character when helen was divested of her lugubrious bonnet and veil her heavy winter cloak etc she looked so like herself that i knew not how to bear it i was particularly glad to see her beautiful black hair unstinted still and unconcealed in its glossy luxuriance mamma has left off her widow's cap in honour of uncle's marriage observed arthur reading my looks with a child's mingled simplicity and quickness of observation mamma looked grave and mrs maxwell shook her head and aunt maxwell is never going to leave off hers persisted the naughty boy but when he saw that his pertness was seriously displeasing and painful to his aunt he went and silently put his arm round her neck kissed her cheek and withdrew to the recess of one of the great bay windows where he quietly amused himself with his dog while mrs maxwell gravely discussed with me the interesting topics of the weather the season and the roads i considered her presence very useful as a check upon my natural impulses an antidote to those emotions of tumultuous excitement which would otherwise have carried me away against my reason and my will but just then i felt the restraint almost intolerable and i had the greatest difficulty in forcing myself to attend to her remarks and answer them with ordinary politeness for i was sensible that helen was standing within a few feet of me beside the fire i dared not look at her but i felt her eye was upon me and from one hasty furtive glance 
I thought her cheek was slightly flushed, and that her fingers, as she played with her watch chain, were agitated with that restless, trembling motion which betokens high excitement. Tell me, said she, availing herself of the first pause in the attempted conversation between her aunt and me, and speaking fast and low with her eyes bent on the gold chain, for I now ventured another glance. Tell me, how you all are at Lindenhope? Has nothing happened since I left you? I believe not. Nobody dead, nobody married. No. Or, or expecting to marry. No old ties dissolved or new ones formed. No old friends forgotten or supplanted. She dropped her voice so low in the last sentence that no one could have caught the concluding words but myself, and at the same time turned her eyes upon me with a dawning smile, most sweetly melancholy, and a look of timid though keen inquiry that made my cheeks tingle with inexpressible emotions. I believe not, I answered, certainly not, if others are as little changed as I. Her face glowed in sympathy with mine. And you really did not mean to call, she exclaimed. I feared to intrude. To intrude, cried she, with an impatient gesture. What? But as if suddenly recollecting her aunt's presence, she checked herself, and turning to that lady continued, Why, aunt, this man is my brother's close friend, and was my own intimate acquaintance for a few short months at least, and professed a great attachment to my boy, and when he passes the house so many scores of miles from his home, he declines to look in for fear of intruding. Mr. Markham is over-modest, observed Mrs. Maxwell. Over-ceremonious, rather, said her niece. Over, well, it's no matter. And turning from me, she seated herself in a chair beside the table, and pulling a book to her by the cover, began to turn over the leaves in an energetic kind of abstraction. If I had known, said I, that you would have honored me by remembering me as an intimate acquaintance, I most likely should not have denied myself the pleasure of calling upon you but I thought you had forgotten me long ago. You judged of others by yourself, muttered she, without raising her eyes from the book, but reddening as she spoke and hastily turning over a dozen leaves at once. There was a pause of which Arthur thought he might venture to avail himself to introduce his handsome young setter and show me how wonderfully it was grown and improved and to ask after the welfare of its father Sancho. Mrs. Maxwell then withdrew to take off her things. Helen immediately pushed the book from her, and after silently surveying her son, his friend, and his dog for a few moments, she dismissed the former from the room under pretense of wishing him to fetch his last new book to show me. The child obeyed with alacrity, but I continued caressing the dog. The silence might have lasted till its master's return, had it depended on me to break it. But, in half a minute or less, my hostess impatiently rose, and taking her former station on the rug between me and the chimney-corner, earnestly exclaimed, Gilbert, what is the matter with you? Why are you so changed? It is a very indiscreet question, I know, she hastened to add, perhaps a very rude one. Don't answer it if you think so. But I hate mysteries and concealments. I am not changed, Helen. Unfortunately, I am as keen and passionate as ever. It is not I. It is circumstances that are changed what circumstances do tell me her cheek was blanched with the very anguish of anxiety could it be with the fear that i had rashly pledged my faith to another i'll tell you at once said i i will confess that i came here for the purpose of seeing you not without some monitory misgivings at my own presumption and fears that i should be as little welcome as expected when i came but i did not know that this estate was yours until enlightened on the subject of your inheritance by the conversation of two fellow passengers in the last stage of my journey. And then I saw at once the folly of the hopes I had cherished and the madness of retaining them a moment longer. And though I alighted at your gates, I determined not to enter within them. I lingered a few minutes to see the place, but was fully resolved to return to M without seeing its mistress. And if my aunt and I had not been just returning from our morning drive, I should have seen and heard no more of you. I thought it would be better for both that we should not meet, replied I, as calmly as I could, but not daring to speak above my breath from conscious inability to steady my voice, and not daring to look in her face lest my firmness should forsake me altogether. I thought an interview would only disturb your peace and madden me. 
but i am glad now of this opportunity of seeing you once more and knowing that you have not forgotten me and of assuring you that i shall never cease to remember you there was a moment's pause mrs huntingdon moved away and stood in the recess of the window did she regard this as an intimation that modesty alone prevented me from asking her hand and was she considering how to repulse me with the smallest injury to my feelings before i could speak to relieve her from such a perplexity she broke the silence herself by suddenly turning towards me and observing you might have had such an opportunity before as far i mean as regards assuring me of your kindly recollections and yourself of mine if you had written to me i would have done so but i did not know your address and did not like to ask your brother because i thought he would object to my writing but this would not have deterred me for a moment if i could have ventured to believe that you expected to hear from me or even wasted a thought upon your unhappy friend but your silence naturally led me to conclude myself forgotten did you expect me to write to you then no helen mrs huntingdon said i blushing at the implied imputation certainly not but if you had sent me a message through your brother or even asked him about me now and then i did ask about you frequently i was not going to do more continued she smiling so long as you continued to restrict yourself to a few polite enquiries about my health your brother never told me that you had mentioned my name did you ever ask him no for i saw he did not wish to be questioned about you or to afford the slightest encouragement or assistance to my too obstinate attachment helen did not reply and he was perfectly right added i but she remained in silence looking out upon the snowy lawn oh i will relieve her of my presence thought i and immediately i arose and advanced to take leave with the most heroic resolution but pride was at the bottom of it or it could not have carried me through are you going already said she taking the hand i offered and not immediately letting it go why should i stay any longer wait till arthur comes at least only too glad to obey i stood and leant against the opposite side of the window you told me you were not changed said my companion you are very much so no mrs huntingdon i only ought to be do you mean to maintain that you have the same regard for me that you had when last we met i have but it would be wrong to talk of it now it was wrong to talk of it then gilbert it would not now unless to do so would be to violate the truth i was too much agitated to speak but without waiting for an answer she turned away her glistening eye and crimson cheek and threw up the window and looked out whether to calm her own excited feelings or to relieve her embarrassment or only to pluck that beautiful half-blown christmas rose that grew upon the little shrub without just peeping from the snow that had hitherto no doubt defended it from the frost and was now melting away in the snow pluck it however she did and having gently dashed the glittering powder from its leaves approached it to her lips and said this rose is not so fragrant as a summer flower but it has stood through hardships none of them could bear the cold rain of winter has sufficed to nourish it and its faint sun to warm it the bleak winds have not blanched it or broken its stem and the keen frost has not blighted it look gilbert it is still fresh and blooming as a flower can be with the cold snow even now on its petals will you have it i held out my hand i dared not speak lest my emotion should overmaster me she laid the rose across my palm but i scarcely closed my fingers upon it so deeply was i absorbed in thinking what might be the meaning of her words and what i ought to do or say upon the occasion whether to give way to my feelings or restrain them still misconstruing this hesitation into indifference or reluctance even to accept her gift helen suddenly snatched it from my hand threw it out on to the snow shut down the window with an emphasis and withdrew to the fire helen what means this i cried electrified at this startling change in her demeanour you did not understand my gift said she or what is worse you despised it i'm sorry i gave it you but since i did make such a mistake the only remedy i could think of was to take it away you misunderstood me cruelly i replied and in a minute i had opened the window again leaped out picked up the flower brought it in 
and presented it to her imploring her to give it to me again and i would keep it forever for her sake and prize it more highly than anything in the world i possessed and will this content you said she as she took it in her hand it shall i answered there then take it i pressed it earnestly to my lips and put it in my bosom mrs huntingdon looking on with a half sarcastic smile now are you going said she i will if if i must you are changed persisted she you are grown either very proud or very indifferent i am neither helen mrs huntingdon if you could see my heart you must be one if not both and why mrs huntingdon why not helen as before helen then dear helen i murmured i was in an agony of mingled love hope delight uncertainty and suspense the rose i gave you was an emblem of my heart said she would you take it away and leave me here alone would you give me your hand too if i asked it have i not said enough she answered with a most enchanting smile i snatched her hand and would have fervently kissed it but suddenly checked myself and said but have you considered the consequences hardly i think or i should not have offered myself to one too proud to take me or too indifferent to make his affection outweigh my worldly goods stupid blockhead that i was i trembled to clasp her in my arms but dared not believe in so much joy and yet restrained myself to say but if you should repent it would be your fault she replied i never shall unless you bitterly disappoint me if you have not sufficient confidence in my affection to believe this let me alone my darling angel my own helen cried i now passionately kissing the hand i still retained and throwing my left arm around her you never shall repent if it depend on me alone but have you thought of your aunt i trembled for the answer and clasped her closer to my heart in the instinctive dread of losing my new-found treasure my aunt must not know of it yet said she she would think it a rash wild step because she could not imagine how well i know you but she must know you herself and learn to like you you must leave us now after lunch and come again in spring and make a longer stay and cultivate her acquaintance and i know you will like each other and then you will be mine said i printing a kiss upon her lips and another and another for i was as daring and impetuous now as i had been backward and constrained before no in another year replied she gently disengaging herself from my embrace but still fondly clasping my hand another year oh helen i could not wait so long where is your fidelity i mean i could not endure the misery of so long a separation it would not be a separation we will write every day my spirit shall be always with you and sometimes you shall see me with your bodily eye i will not be such a hypocrite as to pretend that i desire to wait so long myself but as my marriage is to please myself alone i ought to consult my friends about the time of it your friends will disapprove they will not greatly disapprove dear gilbert said she earnestly kissing my hand they cannot when they know you or if they could they would not be true friends i should not care for their estrangement now are you satisfied she looked up in my face with a smile of ineffable tenderness can i be otherwise with your love and you do love me helen said i not doubting the fact but wishing to hear it confirmed by her own acknowledgment if you loved as i do she earnestly replied you would not have so nearly lost me these scruples of false delicacy and pride would never thus have troubled you you would have seen that the greatest worldly distinction and discrepancies of rank birth and fortune are as dust in the balance compared with the unity of accordant thoughts and feelings and truly loving sympathizing hearts and souls but this is too much happiness said i embracing her again i have not deserved it helen i dare not believe in such felicity and the longer i have to wait the greater will be my dread that something will intervene to snatch you from me and think a thousand things may happen in a year i shall be in one long fever of restless terror and impatience all the time and besides winter is such a dreary season i thought so too replied she gravely i would not be married in winter in december at least she added with a shudder for in that month had occurred both the ill-starred marriages that had bound her to her former husband and the terrible death that released her and therefore i said another year in spring 
next spring no no next autumn perhaps summer then well the close of summer there now be satisfied while she was speaking arthur re-entered the room good boy for keeping out so long mamma i couldn't find the book in either of the places you told me to look for it there was a conscious something in mamma's smile that seemed to say no dear i knew you could not but rachel got it for me at last look mr markham a natural history with all kinds of birds and beasts in it and the reading as nice as the pictures in great good humour i sat down to examine the book and drew the little fellow between my knees had he come a minute before i should have received him less graciously but now i affectionately stroked his curling locks and even kissed his ivory forehead he was my own helen's son and therefore mine and as such i have ever since regarded him that pretty child is now a fine young man he has realized his mother's brightest expectations and is at present residing in grassdale manor with his young wife the merry little helen hattersley of yore i had not looked through half the book before mrs maxwell appeared to invite me into the other room to lunch that lady's cool distant manners rather chilled me at first but i did my best to propitiate her and not entirely without success i think even in that first short visit for when i talked cheerfully to her she gradually became more kind and cordial and when i departed she bade me a gracious adieu hoping ere long to have the pleasure of seeing me again but you must not go till you have seen the conservatory my aunt's winter garden said helen as i advanced to take leave of her with as much philosophy and self-command as i could summon to my aid i gladly availed myself of such a respite and followed her into a large and beautiful conservatory plentifully furnished with flowers considering the season but of course i had little attention to spare for them it was not however for any tender colloquy that my companion had brought me there my aunt is particularly fond of flowers she observed and she is fond of stainingly too i brought you here to offer a petition in her behalf that this may be her home as long as she lives and if it be not our home likewise that i may often see her and be with her for i fear she will be sorry to lose me and though she leads a retired and contemplative life she is apt to get low-spirited if left too much alone by all means dearest helen do what you will with your own i should not dream of wishing your aunt to leave the place under any circumstances and we will live either here or elsewhere as you and she may determine and you shall see her as often as you like i know she must be pained to part with you and i am willing to make any reparation in my power i love her for your sake and her happiness shall be as dear to me as that of my own mother thank you darling you shall have a kiss for that good-bye there now there gilbert let me go here's arthur don't astonish his infantile brain with your madness but it is time to bring my narrative to a close any one but you would say i had made it too long already but for your satisfaction i will add a few words more because i know you will have a fellow feeling for the old lady and will wish to know the last of her history i did come again in spring and agreeably to helen's injunctions did my best to cultivate her acquaintance she received me very kindly having been doubtless already prepared to think highly of my character by her niece's too favourable report i turned my best side out of course and we got along marvellously well together when my ambitious intentions were made known to her she took it more sensibly than i had ventured to hope her only remark on the subject in my hearing was and so mr markham you are going to rob me of my niece i understand well i hope god will prosper your union and make my dear girl happy at last could she have been contented to remain single i own i should have been better satisfied but if she must marry again i know of no one now living and of a suitable age to whom i would more willingly resign her than yourself or who would be more likely to appreciate her worth and make her truly happy as far as i can tell of course i was delighted with the compliment and hoped to show her that she was not mistaken in her favourable judgment i have however one request to offer continued she it seems i am still to look on stainingly as my home i wish you to make it yours likewise for helen is attached to the place and to me as i am to her there are painful associations connected with grassdale which she cannot easily overcome 
and i shall not molest you with my company or interference here i am a very quiet person and shall keep my own apartments and attend to my own concerns and only see you now and then of course i most readily consented to this and we lived in the greatest harmony with our dear aunt until the day of her death which melancholy event took place a few years after melancholy not to herself for it came quietly upon her and she was glad to reach her journey's end but only to the few loving friends and grateful dependents she left behind to return however to my own affairs i was married in summer on a glorious august morning it took the whole eight months and all helen's kindness and goodness to boot to overcome my mother's prejudices against my bride-elect and to reconcile her to the idea of my leaving linden grange and living so far away yet she was gratified at her son's good fortune after all and proudly attributed it all to his own superior merits and endowments i bequeathed the farm to fergus with better hopes of its prosperity than i should have had a year ago under similar circumstances for he had lately fallen in love with the vicar of l s eldest daughter a lady whose superiority had roused his latent virtues and stimulated him to the most surprising exertions not only to gain her affection and esteem and to obtain a fortune sufficient to enable him to aspire to her hand but to render himself worthy of her in his own eyes as well as in those of her parents and in the end he was successful as you already know as for myself i need not tell you how happily my helen and i have lived and loved together and how blessed we still are in each other's society and in the promising young scions that are growing up about us we are just now looking forward to the advent of you and rose for the time of your annual visit draws nigh when you must leave your dusty smoky noisy toiling striving city for a season of invigorating relaxation and social retirement with us till then farewell gilbert markham staningley june tenth eighteen forty seven End of Volume 3, Chapter 16, Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine End of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte